Okay, um, Maju Mai, everyone, um, and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Economy Committee due to ongoing safeguarding measures in place um, in regards to COVID 19. Um, our witnesses will be briefing us this morning uh, via teleconference, um, apart from the Minister uh, and, the, um, and Dermot, who are here for our meeting this morning. Um, the committee will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Just to remind members to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. Um, item 1 on the agenda, we have apologies from Stuart Dixon due to continuing illness um, and also from Christopher Stalford uh, and we uh, send our best wishes to both of them to get well soon. Um, so item number two then, draft minutes. Uh, there is a copy of the draft minutes from the meeting on the 8th of June at page five in your pack, from the 9th of June and page seven in your pack, and the 10th of June on in page nine in your pack. So are members content that the minutes are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Great. Thank you. Okay. Moving on then to item number three, which is chairperson's business. There's an invitation um, from the chair of the European Union Committee at page 15 um, for myself and the deputy chair to attend a virtual meeting to discuss how committees can work together and scrutinise the protocol um, <coughs> in the withdrawal agreement and other topical issues arising from the UK withdrawal from the EU. So there is a date set for the Tuesday the 30th of June um, from 3pm to 5pm using MS Teams and other members are welcome to join that meeting also if they wish. So are members content that myself and Sinead attend that virtual meeting? Yeah. Great. Okay, so we'll move straight on then to item number four, which is our ministerial briefing this morning on the impact of COVID-19 and also an update on city deals. So um, we'll invite the minister and Dermot to um, maybe outline their statements first of all, and then we'll open it up to members. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, to come back to the committee. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for lockdown has impacted on our lives in ways that we could not have possibly imagined a few short months ago. While the focus has rightly been to protect the health of all of our citizens, the lockdown has created an economic crisis of a magnitude that is eye-watering. Businesses in all sectors have been severely affected by the strict lockdown measures and many are desperately working to simply survive. We have already seen redundancies in aerospace and aviation and know that other jobs will be lost. The quarterly employment survey figures released yesterday cover a period that predates COVID-19 related restrictions and therefore does not take into account the full impact the virus has had on employment. However, we can see a significant increase of almost 10% in the claimant count for May 2020 bringing it to its highest point since 2013. This is the harsh reality of the impact of the virus on the economy. But running alongside these difficulties and hardships, we have also witnessed the resilience of many businesses which have risen to the challenge and adapted and changed to fit in with the new normal. They introduced social distancing measures, increased cleaning, and modified in other ways to ensure they could remain open. Others planned for the time when they were permitted to reopen and have worked extremely hard to ensure the safety of their staff and customers is at the core of all that they do. It is this grit and resolve so characteristic of the business community that we will harness as we plan for the future. In reacting to the crisis, my department's immediate focus was to shield and protect as many local businesses as possible from the worst impacts of the sudden reduction in the demand for goods and services and the cash flow difficulties that it created. 410 million was made available to fund three unconventional grant schemes with well over 300 million having already been distributed. This was on top of the non-domestic rates holiday provided by the Department of Finance. My department reacted quickly to completely revise its annual 2020-21 business plan, of which you have a copy. This clearly and carefully outlines how the department is and plans to respond to the crisis throughout the year as we move from the react phases through the recovery and rebuild phases. In addition to that, I have published my medium-term strategic economic recovery plan 
covering the next 12 to 18 months. Titled Rebuilding a Stronger Economy, it sets out a framework to deliver higher paying jobs, a highly skilled workforce and a more regionally balanced economy. To assist me in this task earlier uh, today, I announced the membership of the Economic Advisory Group, which will be chaired by Elvina Graham. I look forward to working closely with this group and know that their combined business and economic experience will be extremely valuable to me as we plan ahead. I hope they will help us to identify global market opportunities and ensure that we understand the best sectors to focus on. I want to build on our world-class reputation in areas such as cybersecurity, fintech and digital startups. The advisory group will also support the development of a strategy and associated economic policy interventions aimed at the longer term reshaping of the economy. We want to support businesses through this difficult period and drive the growth of high value sectors. We need to seize opportunities. I have already taken the first practical tentative steps to refocus my department's budgets, budget on recovery and rebuild. This week, I approved the reallocation of 30 million from within my department's budget to address emerging COVID-19 pressures. It will be spent on addressing pressures in skills and education and on initiatives to help businesses that are vulnerable but viable. Other, on further issues, I was delighted on Monday to be able to announce earlier dates agreed by the executive for the reopening of key sectors of the tourism and hospitality industry. They are conditional on controlling the rate of transmission of COVID-19 and social distancing measures which will remain in place. Setting these dates is an important step on the road to recovery and enables the industry to plan ahead. I know the innovation and strength I have witnessed in the tourism and hospitality industry is replicated across the whole business community. But it is important that I emphasise that the work of the department is not limited to managing the pandemic through the pandemic, fundamental as that is. The annual business plan outlines many critical matters that we continue to take forward in tandem. We are working to prepare for EU exit. We continue to work on both the City Deals programme and Project Stratum and are taking forward essential work on our skills and energy strategies. The output from these will be as equally important in helping to rebuild the Northern Ireland economy. Finally, Chair, I want to pay tribute to my departmental staff who have been at the forefront of reacting to this crisis and who will play an important role in shaping and redirecting the rebuild phase. They have worked day and night during lockdown to respond to the needs of the economy, the executive and MLAs. At times they do not get the recognition they deserve. And I want to publicly do so now. So lastly, Chair, things will be different in the future for all of us. But working together, we can rebuild, adapt and innovate to ensure that Northern Ireland's economic future is bright. Thank you. Um, are we doing the city deals? Or is yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Chair. The committee have had the briefing paper, so I, I'll not go through that in any great depth. Uh, merely just perhaps to highlight that the department is only one of the departments involved in delivering city deals across uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, DFE, the department, is the accountable department for the innovation, digital tourism and employability skills within those, uh, the, those city deals. It is estimated that the capital expenditure on those projects across the uh, deals will be in the order of £800 million over the next 10 years. The department officials, uh, together with Invest NI and Tourism NI staff, have over the last 18 months been working closely with the councils in the Belfast Regional City Deal as well as uh, the uh, Derry and Straban deals, uh, looking to help and inform their work on developing strategic outline cases in the uh, case of the Derry and Straban deal and in relation to taking forward the work that they are doing on OBCs on the uh, innovation projects. Belfast is obviously the most advanced of the city deals with heads of terms signed on the 26th of March 2019. Uh, that, those heads of terms reference leveraging investment of up to £1 billion. 
350 million will come from uh, Treasury, 350 million will come from the Executive, with the remainder coming from councils and project promoters and private sector investment. The Belfast deal itself is made up of 22 integrated projects that are intended to deliver 20,000 new and better jobs and an increase of uh, 470 million gross value added to the economy. The projects cover uh, a number of pillars, innovation, digital, tourism, regeneration, infrastructure and employability. And a brief summary of those projects are included in the pack. At the moment, we have received draft OBCs for four of the innovation projects from the, the Belfast deal. Um, and these have been shared with the Department for Review. And a draft OBC for the final project, the, the Smill project, is anticipated in July. We have provided feedback uh, on the first three, the IREACH, the AMIC and the Global Innovation Institute. Uh, and the, that will be taken on board as they move to finalise the OBCs later this year. And when those come to the department, then we will consider those in conjunction with uh, the MHCLG in London on the technical and financial viability of those projects as part of the assessment of the city deal projects. So that's a brief overview of where we are. We are we, I think we have now received on the 22nd of May the strategic outline case for the two innovation projects from the uh, Derry Strabane city deal. So we will be looking at those and giving our comments and feedback. But we have ha had meetings with officials over the last uh, six to 12 months where we have been kept informed on progress as it has been uh, made. Okay, thank you very much, um, for both of you, for, for the updates. Um, I think we all recognise the, the very significant challenges um, our economy faces locally from both COVID-19 and, and also now as we're, we're looking uh, towards um, the, the continuation of the Brexit negotiations and um, how all of that works out over the next uh, few weeks. Um, and when we'll get a better idea of, of where we are going um, over the next few months. Um, I think it's really important to, to now be planning for the recovery. Obviously, we have seen significant interventions in terms of support for businesses, um, and I'm sure we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Um, but I think in terms of the recovery planning, um, I just had a, got a, a brief look at the um, plan that was published uh, last night um, this morning and us also uh, as we do now try to help businesses prepare for um, for Brexit and the, the implementation of the protocol. Um, I think that the the reestablishment of the, the economic advisory group is um, very it's an important um, and it, it is welcome in terms of um, guiding the, the recovery planning. Um, I, I had a look at the membership and I think perhaps there, there's a missed opportunity to have representatives from um, from the trade unions. I was quite surprised that there wasn't a trade union representative in the, the panel um, and I think it would have been useful to have some representatives from um, community and voluntary social enterprise sector involved in that as well. Um, and also I suppose if we are looking to a kind of greener recovery voices from that, that sector as well. Um, and I was wondering if, if the, you have any intention of looking um, at widening the membership or having additional people involved in, in certain aspects of the, the uh, recovery group or the advisory group. Oh, sorry, sorry. Well, um, sorry, I, I thought there was another question well, coming. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, um, I'm really glad that um, we have got our, our short uh, to medium term economic strategy paper out. Um, it focuses on two aspects, which one is the more immediate um, and fundamental aspect of how we recover from uh, the COVID-19, the lockdown, uh, and the pressures uh, that that has put on businesses um, and indeed on families right across Northern Ireland. We've seen those pressures um, in the last week um, in the redundancy announcements in the aerospace uh, industry. They reflect um, <coughs> global and national trends um, and we've seen the outworking of them here in Northern Ireland. Um, so, you know, it's important that we get uh, that aspect of our work out. But we are also looking to the longer term of the Northern Ireland economy. And I'm absolutely determined 
uh, to use the, my time as the economy minister within this mandate to set an economic strategy, a pathway forward for the Northern Ireland economy, which will help us to build uh, the Northern Ireland uh, that we want to see, uh, an economic future that is bright for our young people and where businesses and communities can thrive. So therefore, we look to reform the economic advisory group. And that economic advisory group is made up of people who are leaders in their field. Um, and they are there to identify global market opportunities as well as opportunities across Northern Ireland. We will absolutely always focus on our core industries and our core values. So those industries like tourism, um, like agri-food, where we already are excellent and we need to rebuild and recover, we will continue to focus on those. But this economic advisory group is set up to try to look at what is, are the future uh, emerging trends? Where are the global opportunities? How can Northern Ireland tap into those global uh, opportunities? And how can we respond quickly? Because, of course, the region or the country that responds quickly and has a developed plan to respond will get uh, the best of the opportunities as they emerge uh, and as we emerge globally from uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So that's the rationale for uh, the Economic Advisory Group. I think that that is really, really important that we set the trends. Um, and we have asked people who are leaders in their field. We are already world class in uh, many of these areas. So we want to know how we can develop other um, and, and continue um, to seize opportunities in areas where we are world class and develop other areas and seize those opportunities. That's the rationale. We will, of course, uh, and of course the members of the EAG will always look at issues like entrepreneurship, social enterprise, regional economic balance. Those are really uh, core and fundamental values that we will continue to look at, but we want to look at those emerging global opportunities. I see this as an exciting opportunity to work together with uh, business communities as our partners as we develop an economic strategy for the long-term future of Northern Ireland. Um, oh, and I think we, we all recognise that the need to, to be looking towards those opportunities um, as we rebuild as well. Um, I, I just feel that there, there was an opportunity to have some new voices and new sectors uh, represented in terms of planning for all of that. Um, and in terms of also the, the recovery plan in general, um, obviously we do face you know, um, really unprecedented circumstances um, and we've seen collapse, I suppose, of global uh, supply chains over the past, past wee while. Um, and the focus, therefore, on our indigenous business is really important um, and is referenced in um, <coughs> some of the, the plans and papers that we have seen to date. Um, but also, I suppose, in terms of planning for the recovery on, on an all-island basis to take advantage of the, the interconnectedness that we have across the island um, and the opportunity that there is um, in terms of that, I think would need to be more strongly reflected in, in our recovery plans as well. Um, and in terms of, of Brexit um, planning, we've seen the, the report from the, the Brexit group here in, in the north um, a couple of weeks ago um, real concerns over the, um, the planning that has been taking place so far, um, the interaction with particularly the British government, but also the, the executive in terms of um, in terms of the, what it means for business. And I was just wondering what work the department is doing to engage with uh, business um, to help them plan, and in terms of the. Um, the budget rate allocations that we have seen, um, is there plans to put funds directly into support for businesses to plan for Brexit as well? Okay, um, so quite a lot there <laughs> in, in trying to respond. So I know you'll come back to me if I miss anything. Um, <coughs> so this is a, a, medium to short, a short to medium term plan for the Northern Ireland economy. Now, of course, the Northern Ireland economy, like every other economy across the world, does not exist onto itself 
and will always have to take account of what is happening uh, in other economies uh, and indeed in other regions right across the British Isles. Um, so that's an important uh, thing that all of us uh, know uh, must be happening. Um, so in terms of, of where we are with this plan, this is about the Northern Ireland economy. This is how we revitalise, re-energise, <coughs> renew, reimagine the Northern Ireland economy, how we support our core and traditional um, um, industries, um, how we uh, then look to new and exciting uh, markets and opportunities. And that is what the plan is about, and that's where I'm uh, fixing um, our, our uh, future firmly on. Um, in terms of uh, Brexit planning, we of course are continuing um, to uh, look at uh, the issues around Brexit. But in terms of the economy, <coughs> the single biggest thing that we need to ensure is that we have unfettered access to our most important market. I have said this many, many times over the last number of years, but it is an absolute fact that we sell more in GB than we do in ROI, the rest of Europe and the rest of the world all put together. So unfettered access is the single biggest issue that we have to deal with uh, in terms of the protocol um, for the Northern Ireland economy. Um, and that is absolutely vital. All of the other things are very, very important, but the most and the single biggest thing is ensuring that uh, we have that unfettered access. And that is where my focus has been um, in our conversations uh, with national uh, government and across the executive. And of course, also within Brexit planning, and I'm not sure if we want to go down the rabbit hole of a, a lot of the issues around Brexit planning, but just to mention a few because I think they're very important. So, um, for example, um, I have been in contact with the Department for International Trade because we also need to work out and ensure that Northern Ireland <coughs> operating within the, con the confines uh, of the protocol, will be able to access those really important trade deals um, that the UK government uh, are currently negotiating. And that Northern Ireland should access them on the same basis as every other part of the United Kingdom's internal market. Um, so that is a, an, an absolutely vital part uh, of our work with uh, the Department uh, for International Trade. And this morning, um, I uh, gave some comment um, to the terms of the trade deal um, around or, or the ambitions for the trade deal with New Zealand and Australia, where um, our agri-food sector will be put under considerable pressure um, by uh, that particular trade deal. We need to protect um, our core industries and ensure that they're not open also to unfair competition with goods being imported uh, from across the world. So we really important work to do in terms of international trade. But there's also a section of our work that is equally as important, and that is being prepared legislatively um, for um, Brexit on, uh, at the end of the year. Um, whether we, whatever our views on Brexit, um, we will be leaving the European Union at the end of the year. So I, my, my focus, and I hope to work with you to achieve this focus, is ensuring that we are ready to do that in a legislative sense. Um, currently, I'm working on trying to bring forward um, work around um, mutual recognition of qualifications. Now, it is really, really important that we get that through, that we can get that passed. And I think that our legislative preparedness will be a mixture of tapping into some of the work that is done at Westminster and some of the primary legislation that we will need to pass here in Northern Ireland. So for things like uh, mutual recognition of qualifications, my view is that we can tap in easily to uh, the Westminster route um, and uh, get uh, involved with the SI. Um, but so far that has been difficult to get uh, to the executive. Uh, and I would urge members of this committee to work with their parties to ensure 
that this actually is on the executive table. Um, you know, all of the professional bodies agree with our course of action. Indeed, I think across the political spectrum, there is widespread agreement with this course of action. This will get an important uh, <coughs> building block in place for people to work across, for example, even the common travel area. Um, and I think we should go ahead and use our Westminster uh, route, the SIs, there in order to get uh, that on the statute book. So there will be um, significant legislation that uh, will be required around the single e electricity market, etc. as well. And I hope to work really constructively with the committee to ensure that we are ready legislatively, legally, um, for the end of the year. Um, and I suppose just since, since we've opened the, the Brexit, um, the big, yeah, the Brexit can. Um, in terms of the the new um, infrastructure that, that it will be required um, and the, the types of checks that we're going to need to see, um, there's going to be a significant increase in the number of customs officials that may be required. Um, is the department doing work in relation to that, and also in terms of you know maybe uh, providing the the opportunity for skilling of, of uh, those type of professionals? Um, and in relation to um, the, that type of checks and tariffs that we may see, but we're not entirely clear of what it's all going to look like. Um, obviously, there is concerns from the likes of the retail sector, um, reports that you know there are, are some considering pulling out of the north um, because of the, the uncertainty or the additional um, requirements that there may be. Um, in terms of engaging with the, the sectors and with the British government, um, are we trying to resolve those issues? Um, my view, um, which I've reiterated over many, many years, is that we are part of the United Kingdom and therefore our access to and from that market should be unfettered, to use a, a common phrase. Um, I have said that right throughout um, the... <coughs> Brexit debate um, and uh, before uh, we actually had um, the, the withdrawal agreement. My view has always been to protect our biggest market, uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, and I regret um, that that has not always been the focus um, and that other um, markets were, were not as important, were prioritised on a political level. But we are where we are. Um, and now it is my job to ensure that neither our consumers are restricted in their choice or by the price of the goods and the, the commodities that they require, and that our manufacturing sector has access uh, to its most important market. Um, around two-thirds, to take it around about to round it up, of everything we sell... Um, is, uh, goes to market in GB. Similarly, for our high street and for our manufacturing chain, the same goes from GB to NI. So that it is really important that we understand that checks uh, will be difficult for businesses um, and that they should be kept to a minimum. And I remember some time ago, Michel Barnier, uh, when he was trying, when I was sitting long, long ago now, it seems, not that long ago, but it seems a long time ago, um, when I was sitting in his office in the Berlimont, um, and he would have said, you know, but, but we can keep these to a minimum. These need to be light touch. Now it seems that the European Union um, might have a slightly different, more legalistic view of that. I think it behoves all of us to ensure that both sides to this debate, both at our national government and at the European level, understand the impact on the Northern Ireland economy um, should uh, they insist uh, on all of these things. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that that's you know a, a fair point in terms of the impact on the economy. Um, and obviously, like you say, both sides of that uh, political um, negotiation really need to live up to the commitments. And I think there is trust issues um, in respect of the, the British government at the minute um, and fully implementing the protocol as was agreed um, and so we would encourage um, them to, to live up to that, um, their commitments and all of that. I'm going to bring in some other members now just to get through some questions. Sorry. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Minister and Dermot, for uh, coming along today. Um, just again to put on record our thanks for uh, the work that has been done. Uh, I think that it has in some ways been a very uh, productive uh, couple of weeks in terms of getting the economy back uh, up and running. Um, the hospitality sector and the, the, the retail sectors particularly uh, haven't spoken to them uh, and, and have been very public in acknowledging uh, the fact that uh, they welcome the clarity and they welcome the support uh, given by you, Minister. So I think it is important that as a committee uh, we recognise that. Uh, in terms of the Economic Advisory Group, obviously there's been a lot of commentary. It's only <laughs> been announced and, uh, as usual, social media uh, gets, gets quite excited over these things. And they should be excited because I think there is an opportunity uh, for this particular group to now focus on the trends. Uh, we know that uh, countries... Uh, who will be successful are those who, who adopt uh, to, to the challenges and adopt to the change. And I think that those people who think that this is a missed opportunity, in my opinion, they're missing the point. Because this group is not about uh, doing things uh, the, the, way, the way they've always been done. This group is about bringing together world leaders, uh, people who actually, I, I think, has to be commended that we've got uh, some of those people to, to come onto this group. Uh, given the fact that their, 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 their schedules, their expertise, these are global players, uh, I think it's very welcome and I do look forward to uh, hearing from them. And I suppose, Minister, that's the crux of my first question is around uh, how do you see that group so, uh, operating, how do you see that group reporting, uh, and how do you see uh, them being able to bring their information forward so that we can uh, make sure that we can secure our position that we already have in terms of being world leaders in and around the fintech, the cyber security um, areas? Yes, thank you uh, for the question. First of all, it is absolutely um, excellent to see retail open. I was up my local high street in Banbridge on, on uh, Friday um, and there were queues outside some shops and um, many of the, the retailers had gone to extraordinary lengths uh, to ensure <coughs> that people would feel both confident and safe and that their employees uh, were uh, in the same space. So I'm really delighted to see retail open. I urge people um, to go out and support local businesses. That's very, very important. Um, but to do so safely and respectfully of uh, others who are um, in the same space. It's absolutely important that we continue to be aware that the virus is still with us uh, and that we need to ensure that people are safe uh, and respectful of others. It's also good that we got a, a date for the reopening of uh, hospitality uh, from the executive on uh, Monday past. This, you know, and I, I don't need to tell you how really important this is for the viability of uh, the tourism and hospitality sectors. I've been working with them for quite some time um, through uh, the tourism steering group, um, and you know they are, are are very are going to be preparing well uh, for that particular uh, event. Um, we try we brought the reopening of caravan sites uh, forward, recognising that they were self-contained, um, and that that might be an easier task for people to prepare for. Just to advise the committee, because I think it's important. Um, we have been working with the guidance that is uh, our national uh, UK guidance uh, around the reopening of uh, tourism and hospitality. Um, and the tourism steering group has been how, uh, looking at it uh, and um, seeing how it can be made um, Northern Ireland friendly. So, for example, we may have some bylaws, etc., that differ slightly um, and how we can ensure that it is fit for purpose in Northern Ireland. Um, as well as that, sectoral bodies within uh, the tourism industry have been bringing forward their own guidance. So they've been bringing forward Hospitality Ulster, for example, has quite extensive guidance out. So the industry is absolutely aware that the safe return of customers and business is of the utmost importance to them. I'm just going to, on that, I'll finish on this because I'm sure there'll be other questions on tourism and hospitality. I will say that my view on the issue around social distancing and the two versus one metre is probably very well known. Um, our industry will survive um, and have a much, 
Well, as someone put it to me, a fighting chance um, if uh, we can go to the World Health Organization recommended one meter for social distancing um, as opposed to two. But that, of course, has to be in line with the medical and scientific evidence of the transmission of the virus here in Northern Ireland. Um, and we will always seek the guidance of our chief medical officer uh, in making any changes. And I know the executive uh, are on that page as well. So important, important um, steps forward uh, for the Northern Ireland economy uh, this week um, and in the weeks to come. Um, in terms of the, the economic advisory group, I do see this as a, an exciting and important opportunity um, to identify global markets, to look um, at where we are already world class. Um, and I, have, I think I've said to this committee before um, that even in the darkest uh, hour of uh, lockdown, um, I was uh, having a, a call with the chief executive of Sigilant in Boston, who is bringing 65 uh, cybersecurity jobs to Northern Ireland because he recognised the skill and the expertise uh, that already is in Northern Ireland um, and how we can develop those aspects of our economy. I was also in March, uh, but for COVID, um, to um, go out where we signed a, a mutual uh, understanding um, with the state of Maryland in developing cyber security. So we are already world class. It's how do we build on these? Mm -hmm. How do we build on the artificial intelligence? And mm -hmm. when I was up at McGee, I saw some of the really exciting uh, and brilliant opportunities that they are developing there. But um, the, the CEO of Siglin said, not only are you world class, not only do you have the skills, but you have great collaboration between your universities and industry. And I think those exciting new opportunities are really important for us as we try to reimagine uh, the, the next uh, economic strategy and the economy for Northern Ireland. Um, so developing on the world-class things that we do, uh, using players who are, live amongst us, who are from us, who are off us, um, um, using those players to develop our economy further and the connections. In terms of reporting, they will, of course, report to the minister. Um, I intend to engage with them um, completely. Um, this is, I see it as a collaboration um, and that uh, we can uh, have that two-way conversation. Um, and knowing some of the figures in the group, I'm sure that that may well be a robust conversation and a challenge function. That's an important element of the work that we will do for the economy going forward. Uh, thanks, Chen. Thanks, Minister, for that. I, I, I look forward to uh, following the progress on that and, and knowing some of the individuals involved as well. I know that uh, they, they will be challenging, but the best <laughs> interests of all of Northern Ireland will be at the forefront. Uh, I, I maybe, Dermot, I suppose just to bring you in on the action uh, and give you an opportunity to, to come in. I suppose it's around maybe the city deal stuff. Um, we know that um, as we move forward that the city deals are going to play an even greater role in terms of the economy going <coughs> forward. Um, the economy department, whilst they appreciate, doesn't have the full um, remit of, of all of the city deals, but it has a significant part. Um, £800 million pounds of the capital expenditure uh, falls within the Department for the Economy. Uh, at this very initial stage, I appreciate that some of the city deals are further forward than others, but are there any uh, risks that you can point out at this minute in time in terms of um, w potential problems that could come down the line from some of these projects? And apologies, I'm, I, I don't want to be coming across as vague, but you know, we know that in terms of the media perspective, there'd be people who would point to, you know, why is this project not moving on quicker than that project, vice versa? Are there any initial, initial risks that you can, you can foresee? Well, certainly when we were working with the Belfast uh, Regional City Deal in, in developing their heads of terms, we recognised that the technical areas that they were bringing forward were the areas where we in Northern Ireland do have strengths and line up with the capability and lined up with the economic strategy mm. and, and the trajectory where we were going. We do recognise that it is quite a significant challenge. It is quite an opportunity to have such a significant investment in our innovation 
uh, in our digital uh, infrastructure something of this scale that we've never had before, so we need to make the most of that opportunity. And I suppose one of the challenges that we have is getting the strategic fit for Northern Ireland across the deals and ensuring that we don't replicate um, Me Too's in each region. And therefore, at the moment, uh, we have, and particularly at the moment, we have a piece of work going on on two of the projects, working with the two universities around the projects that are looking at advanced manufacturing, which we are aware of will be in at least three of the city deals. And, um, and we, we want to ensure that whatever we put in place serves the whole of industry in Northern Ireland and, and not just one region. So that's one of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, obviously, in relation to the, uh, the projects themselves, they are quite large scale in capital, but there's no resource funding coming with them. So it will be critical to look at the business plans for each of those projects to ensure that they will be sustainable and viable in the longer term. The, the last thing we want to do is start uh, building uh, large new buildings, putting in a lot of expensive equipment, but we don't have sufficient resources to have the staffing and the, the, the qu highly qualified people that we will require to take forward the projects in, the, in those centres. So that in itself, and particularly I suppose now in relation to the current crisis, a, a degree of uncertainty from the private sector investors as to the level of investment that they would commit to some of these projects. We do recognise that in developing from OBC to uh, full business <coughs> over the next 12 months or so, we will need to tie some of these things down. Um, we have been challenging the promoters in relation to the um, projected income streams and, and how those line up. The first uh, cut we have seen at the, the four innovation projects from Belfast would actually require at the moment some £24 million from the Department and Resource funding over 10 years just to keep them going. So we need to look at that as to how would that be managed within the Department's uh, innovation and, and technology funding over, over that period. So those are some of the challenges that we're facing at the moment. We uh, have had to say and continue to meet with the, the two universities and try to get alignment, particularly on the <coughs> innovation project at this stage. The tourism projects are probably a bit further behind. They're still at the conception stage, still a lot of work to be done. And obviously, with the, the crises, uh, a lot of those projections will now need to be reworked in light of what is the recovery plan and how long is the recovery plan for the tourism sector in Northern Ireland? And just a very, very final point, but just when we're on it, because it is open now. Uh, the, the, the Ulster University have obviously today indicated potential problems around uh, finances and, and, and in terms of staffing costs and all of that. Have in, has there been any initial conversations in terms of their ability? You know, I, their names printed all over uh, the City Deal projects. Um, uh, you know, is there any indication from them at this minute in time that they have difficulties in terms of their ability? Because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the executive uh, are, are, are doing their bit and they're, they're ensuring that these things move along. But, you know, what we can't have is a situation where the executive or, or ministers are getting the blame for, for problems that are very much outside of their control. I suppose at this stage, I would, I would say that these are at OBC stage, so they are very much based on, on, on what is the longer term plan. I mean, to get any of these projects to actually start being built was probably three, four, five years out for some of them. We, we, we can't have a situation where all these projects are arriving to be built at the same time. We do need, they will be phased in over a number of years. So there is time to plan through. Uh, and obviously we would be looking at each project and working with the, the promoters, be that the University of Ulster, Queens or however, on their financial uh, stability and their, the, the, what, what they can contribute at that particular moment in time. Okay. You have to bear in mind as well that the universities do a lot of speculative um, research funding into the likes of UKRI, the European Union. So they're, they're continually tapping into different funding streams. So at different points in time, there may be peaks and troughs in relation to funding. But obviously, uh, the department as a whole, and I'm sure the minister would confirm, will be looking closely at the financial uh, situation within the University of Ulster before any commitment would be made. Yeah, well, just, just to follow on on that, yes, um, I think that we don't need to rehearse the difficulties 
um, of the Ulster University. Um, I think um, those are, are probably fairly well known uh, within the committee. Um, but for the, the city deals, city deals are an exciting new development. They're an opportunity to invest in, in Northern Ireland and in Northern Ireland's economy. Um, and they're an opportunity in the, the, the medium to long term. We're not pretending uh, in any shape or form that they answer the immediate problems that we have, but they are a medium to long term investment in the economy. Um, and we will be looking um, at each as they come along. We'll be looking at the value for money, the return for the communities, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and how they actually fit in uh, with our economic strategy to, to boost uh, that uh, goal of more jobs uh, and better paying jobs and a more productive economy. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Gary. Um, can I just pick up very briefly on, on Gary's points because I think that um, the, the growth deals are going to be really important to the, the recovery planning um, uh, across the whole of the, the North um, and you know, in tackling that that regional imbalance, in terms of the coordination that you have talked about, and you know, the, the com complementarity of the of the projects, is there a, like a, an overarching um, um, governance or management of the pro the projects to to um, develop that out to ensure that complementarity? Um, you know, in terms of, for example, you mentioned the different projects having um, advanced manufacturing, for example. Yeah. Um, in terms of all of that being, you know, both um, support for the region, like for example, mine in Cosmic Coast and Glens, you, you would perhaps look at the, the tourism aspects, the, the energy, um, green energy potential, those types of things. Uh, are those all being managed in a, in a way that is joined up? Well, certainly from the department's perspective, we are looking at those. Uh, and obviously from an executive perspective, if you, uh, the paper, at Annex A sets out the governance arrangements that are being put in place. There will be a Northern Ireland Cities Growth Deal Delivery Board uh, with an SRO representatives from each of the departments to make sure that we, uh, as the executive and delivering for the executive, are joined up in relation to the specific aspects within our department's control. We are looking to ensure that there will be complementarity, for example, in relation to the advanced manufacturing We've asked Digital Catapult UK to undertake a review of the proposals that we have to date and to look at their complementarity and to ensure that they, that they would together provide an effective solution for Northern Ireland as opposed to looking at them in, individually. And on uh, artificial intelligence, we've asked Digital Catapult NI uh, to work with the two universities and uh, together coming forward with a, a, an artificial intelligence strategy or, or overarching plan for Northern Ireland and that builds on the work that we did uh, last year <coughs> where we got the Turing Institute to do an analysis of the capability of the artificial intelligence capabilities within both Queen's and the University of Ulster and that highlighted that individually they probably didn't rank in the top 10 within the, the UK but to taken together the capability of, of the two universities did put them as one of the leading areas for artificial intelligence in the UK and I think it's, that is the message that we have to be looking at from an economic uh, development perspective is it's the capability of Northern Ireland as a whole, not one uh, institution over another institution, it's how do we harness the capabilities across the region to best support um, the development of industry, the create the jobs, the, the high uh, value jobs for our for our people here in Northern Ireland, how do we harness that and then how do we turn that into a business opportunity going forward and it is essential in getting those linkages into industry and industry in Northern Ireland isn't going to say well I'm going to go to this one and not that one or I'll support, they're not going to support three projects in three regions, they will want to support uh, a concept that helps them deliver what they want to do and the, the way that they are going to move forward with developing their industry in the future. And so to a certain extent, location, they'd be agnostic. And what they certainly don't want to see is replication and duplication across Northern Ireland. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Minister, for your briefing this morning uh, and Dermot as well. Um, and I welcome your comments uh, about the business community in Northern Ireland um, showing grit and resolve because they certainly have, uh, and uh, we all know that firsthand. Uh, and it's been very trying times for them, uh, and a lot of people have stepped up, uh, which is great. Um, the Economic Advisory Group, I really, really welcome it, and you've got great people on it. But there's a couple of, of, of sectors I believe are missing, and I know that you've got a, a tourism advisory body as well, but tourism is not in that, in that and it's one of our key areas of growth <coughs> as well. And the other um, is health and life sciences, which is our high potential growth area as well, and, and, and I'm a wee bit concerned that that's missing, and uh, the green economy, because I think everything has to be driven through that as well. So that's that's an observation. And in, rela uh, in relation to kind of a terms of reference for the Economic Advisory um, Committee, I mean, I think at the heart of it all has to be economic and social recovery on a sub-regional basis as well. You know, it's not one size fits all in Northern Ireland, unfortunately. We have a lot of um, inequalities in a lot of areas of, of Northern Ireland, and we've got to give that remit to the Economic Advisory Committee as well, that uh, sub-regional balance is, is, is completely important within the terms of reference. Um, but absolutely, uh, I, I think uh, the voice of business um, must be at the heart of, of our recovery and uh, in, in, in your workings out of, of, of the various schemes and what you've been doing so far I think you recognize that uh, very very well and some of uh, some of the the bodies that you've got together have been really productive uh, and thank you for that now there's one other aspect that um, there, there there's a large amount of uh, manufacturing groups SMEs that have fallen out of everything. And I know that there's a lot of un underspent in some areas um, of the grants. I think you know we we need to save what we've got. You know, rather you know we can concentrate on developing our business community and 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 all of that and and you know maybe attracting FDI. But what we have to do is save what we've currently got here, and that's our SMEs, particularly in that manufacturing. Uh, and and I'm concerned about the mid Ulster export. Uh, companies as well because a lot of them were there and they've fallen through everything um, and, and just for growth and recovery it's important uh, and I, have you given any thought to any of that? So first of all just just to, to tackle the issue around the tourism um, I think if anyone has seen the work that we've been doing in the department over the last number of weeks you will understand how important we think that tourism uh, is uh, to the Northern Ireland economy and uh, to Northern Ireland families and the jobs, the important jobs that that provides. Um, and because it is so core and uh, so important, tourism has its own steering group uh, and its own recovery group and will, um, once we get past the reopening issues, will be bringing forward its own recovery plan. I intend for that group to stay in place so tourism will have that uh, sectoral and hospitality will have that uh, voice uh, within uh, the department and, and for uh, their particular sector for the remainder of this mandate. That's an important uh, signal uh, for the industry. <coughs> so they, they are already, and I mean, I, I chair it myself and I have chaired every single meeting uh, myself, which is an important commitment from me as to the importance of tourism and hospitality um, and I will maintain that because I think that this is a sector, I mean I think it's just been dealt a devastating blow by COVID-19 and we will need to work very very hard um, to um, bring that all back together again and even in terms of recovery and back to Dermot's um, particular responsibility I mean there is a, a significant budget to bring forward uh, tourism projects within the city and growth deals. 
um, and I look forward to them being developed because I think they will sustain tourism in the long term. And um, I, I can remember many years ago uh, talking to Tourism Ireland and they, they talked about having to provide product for tourists to come and see, experiences for tourism. Um, and I think that that uh, investment um, that will come from the city and growth deals will be very, very important uh, for local tourism. Um, you know, for, I don't know, <coughs> developing the Gobbins path or, or, you know, some of the really important and absolutely wonderful tourism attractions uh, that we have in Northern Ireland. So tourism, absolutely core, absolutely central to what we're doing um, and particularly never forget those 65,000 jobs that we need to protect um, and the businesses that we need to grow. So very important. In terms of uh, sub-regional balance uh, and uh, the economic advisory group, this is a group that is about the global um, era. It's about looking out at global opportunities. It's about saying, this is what we are already world class in. How can we develop this? But what are the new opportunities out there? What are the new global trends that we can bring to Northern Ireland um, and that we can develop? Um, and it's about developing uh, all sorts of different areas of the economy um, and all sorts of different areas of the economy will benefit through that. So social enterprise will benefit, entrepreneurship will benefit. These people are entrepreneurial by their very nature. They are looking for more opportunities um, to, to bring that to Northern Ireland. And of course, in doing so, we will benefit the whole of the regional economy. And I've already given uh, my commitment uh, to uh, a, a balanced uh, regional economy. And I think that that is important for Northern Ireland. But can I say just on that particular issue, it is also really important that as we look at a balanced regional economy, that we look at the skills and the investment in skills in those local economies. So I am very, very um, really determined that we will bring forward a skills strategy for Northern Ireland that will invest in local communities and will invest in young people and people right throughout their working life. Um, and I think that's an important uh, element of getting that regional balance to the economy. And I want us to look not just at skills, but about within that skills, a, a, a layer that's really important to me that includes opportunity for all and I see that education and skills really really important in developing opportunity for communities where there have been many and difficult problems um, and in your city um, and in, right across Northern Ireland we have seen the outworking of those problems and if we are to build a stable prosperous Northern Ireland then we've got to ensure that our young people have education and opportunity and building their skills opportunities is really important uh, in this era. Um, in terms of the grants um, and uh, the SME manufacturing groups, I was actually looking just before I came here at the uh, figures for uh, where people, you know, in, in the sectors where most people were furloughed, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there is no doubt uh, that many, the vast majority of people who were furloughed were furloughed within the manufacturing sector. And that points to a vulnerability for those jobs in uh, the, the short term. Um, so it is really, really important to uh, try to work with and protect uh, our manufacturing sector. And of course, when we talk about them falling through the cracks, which is this great phrase now that we have, um, you know, remember every one of those companies has been able to engage with the National Furlough Scheme, which has, I think, been unprecedented and has protected jobs uh, within the companies. Each of them will have been able to avail of uh, the, the rates relief um, for the period uh, that's suitable for them. So there has been a significant um, input into those companies. Um, for uh, information, uh, we are currently developing a paper which will go to the executive. That will identify the amount of uh, underspend within the grant schemes. 
that will identify the different sectors um, and areas where that uh, where people feel that and where we've had representation uh, around and where people feel that they haven't uh, money has not been made available to them. And then it will be for the executive to take a decision as to how uh, that goes forward. Um, and I hope that that will um, be brought to the executive probably at the start of next week in line with the June monitoring papers. And just another quick um, observation regarding the June monitoring round. Uh, we had a meeting, uh, the committee had a meeting on Monday and I welcome the, the uh, profiling of <coughs> for the apprenticeship programme, mm -hmm. uh, an enhanced apprenticeship programme. Um, and just if you could tell me a wee bit more of your thinking in terms of numbers um, that, that may be able to avail of, of that programme and will there be support, I mean monetary support, to the businesses in order to make sure that they're a cog in that way. It's okay giving money to the further education colleges uh, and even the higher education universities for apprenticeship programmes, but if we haven't got it married to the, the, the businesses themselves to take on apprenticeships, it won't work because they're the vital they're the vital clock and because businesses are so vulnerable now at the minute there are potential job losses it's very hard for them to pick up a new apprenticeship programs uh, at this moment in time unless they're supported financially we um, have identified that when we look and any analysis of the um, stats uh, for uh, those who have joined the unemployment register that comes forward indicates to us that the people that are most vulnerable are those who are young, um, who are on part-time contracts, uh, etc., and women. Um, and those are the most vulnerable groups, and those are the ones that have been hit the hardest and most immediately um, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it's important just to, I often reflect on this stat, that in April, we added to the register the same number of people um, that we had taken six years uh, to uh, reduce unemployment. It's, a, it's incredibly, I think it shows the depth uh, of uh, the, the difficulty um, very, very starkly. So six years of labour market progress was uh, just disappeared um, with those people who were added to the register. Uh, in April and as you can see this trend has continued and we've seen the impact of those global difficulties in aerospace and the outworking of those in companies in Northern Ireland so um, it, 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 we are in a difficult space but in our uh, review uh, of our uh, budget uh, and how we could uh, look at some of those pressures we identified quite rightly I think that those uh, pressures will come on young people, particularly young people who are apprentices or who may already have an apprenticeship, uh, or those firms that might take on apprentices. Um, we are currently developing the scheme, and as our thinking on this becomes uh, clearer, we will, of course, share it with the committee. I think that's important. But I want uh, the committee to be absolutely clear that it is forefront in my mind that we support not just the young people, but the businesses to maintain those young people. And maybe just, uh, it's an aside, but maybe just important to say that it was really good to visit Portadown Further Education College this week, um, where some young people were in uh, doing their adaptive assessments so that they can complete their vocational uh, qualifications. Um, one of the young people, and just relates to your point, Sinead, one of the young people that I was talking to was indicating um, that with his, uh, the firm that he is working, if he couldn't have uh, completed his uh, assessment, gained his further step on his vocational qualification, then his job uh, would be lost to him. So it's really important that we get those young people into college um, and that we allow them to complete their vocational qualifications so that they can step on in their uh, career pathway. Have I forgotten anything to else? Totally agree. No, no, that's fine. Thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, could I maybe just follow on your point on the EAG? It was never the intention that it would cover all that's sectors, right. but I would point out that um, the department has a matrix panel, the science and technology panel, which covers a wide range of technology areas and, and, and informs our policies in those areas. And that's chaired by Dr. Rob Grundy, 
who w will be on the EAG, and he has a health and life sciences background, okay. and is currently working on look, working with the university and Invest NI on setting up a high health and life sciences representative group in Northern Ireland. All right, a dedicated group. Sorry? A dedicated group? A Harani. Uh, there is yeah. a proposal in relation to setting up a group that will look at uh, marketing the health and life sciences capabilities of Northern Ireland internationally. Excellent. Okay. Well done. Uh, in the European Parliament, just as a company, one of the things that I was able to do was bring all those companies from Northern Ireland who um, were uh, and invested in the connected health sphere. Absolutely astounding work that they're mm -hmm. they're actually doing here, and we want to build on that. Yeah. John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair, for your um, information so far. It's been really enlightening. Um, just to touch on the city deal, first of all. Um, Carrick Fergus and my constituency set to benefit significantly from that from a regeneration point of view and we do look forward to seeing that rolled out. Gary's already alluded to some of the concerns among local um, representatives about the potential for, for delays, but hopefully we do see that come into fruition uh, very soon. Um, like you, Minister, I welcome the appointment of the EAG. Um, we congratulate Ms Graham in her role as Chair. There are some very high profile and significant people on that, and we all wish them the very best, because if they succeed, then Northern Ireland succeeds, and I think that is the key. This, these are unprecedented times. It's become a cliche, um, and we have to do whatever we can to try and grow the Northern Ireland economy and stave off the worst of, of the impact of COVID-19. Uh, you talked about that group looking at global trends, and you did touch on it. One of those global trends that is so significant around the world at the minute is growing the social economy. And I would love, like the Chair and the Vice Chair have alluded to, to see a representative from um, Social Enterprise and or the social economy on there. S Scandinavian countries, Canada, have all made social enterprise a cornerstone of their economy. And I think with the Social Value Act and um, going forward and the opportunity to change the way we do things, that could be something that could be filtered in there. And I know you say they'll be looking at it, but there's no bigger an advocate for a sector than somebody engrossed and embedded in the sector. And if that was something that could be looked at, I think it would only add to the significance and the, and the role that that group plays. So perhaps we would have a look at that. Um, we've heard the startling figures already about the unemployment figures and my fear is that could only grow as the furlough scheme starts to, ease, um, starts to drop off and businesses start to see really what their bottom line is looking at. Um, you've touched on those most impacted about that being women and young people. And there is a fear now that our young people will become the forgotten generation. In a survey by the Youth Forum alluded to in Good Morning also this morning, 20% of young people put unemployment as a massive issue for them. And while you've touched on some of the aspects of what we can do for young people, can you just talk me through maybe what creative solutions you have to support them? Uh, a lot of those who are losing their jobs are in the hospitality industry. They fear that there's not going to be something for them in the short term or even medium term. And while they hear talk about schemes that are going forward, they want to hear some creative solutions now. We used to have a scheme in Northern Ireland called Action for Community Employment. Um, it was very beneficial and maybe never perfect, but something along those lines um, just that could help them because, as I say, there is that fear that that forgotten generation could, could come about. I'll stop on that one to begin with, Minister. Thank you. Um, so uh, I've, I've already really touched on uh, the social enterprise. Yeah. Social, social enterprise is an incredibly important uh, sector of the economy, not just because it's a growing sector of the economy, um, but because it uh, genuinely takes people <coughs> who are far from the labour market um, and helps them uh, to be part of the labour market. Um, and for that reason and for always, we will always be supportive of trying to ensure uh, that our social economy sector has a bright future. As I've said, the EAG isn't about one sector. It's mm -hmm. about getting world-class people who are part of our community in Northern Ireland to look at those world-class global trends and see how we can import that to Northern Ireland or how we can grasp those opportunities. As I've said, and I, I think this is so important and I look forward to working with you on it, I believe that uh, Northern Ireland as a region, if it prepares early and prepares well, will be able to grab those opportunities uh, quickly and so enhance uh, our ability to, to make our economy prosper. And if our economy prospers, families prosper. And that's a really, really important element of everything that we do. Um, you're quite right about young people. I think in the last recession, young people were the hardest hit. 
um, and uh, suffered uh, very gravely from lack uh, of economic opportunity. That's why, of course, when you look at how I have uh, reorganised the budget for the department uh, and the easements that we could make, um, I have uh, tried to uh, support young people. Some of that support that we have reorganised for is for the immediate future. So for those young people who haven't access to IT, it's about trying to give them access to IT. And it's about promoting opportunity for all young people. As I said to Sinead, one of the areas that I really want us to develop is uh, that area of uh, apprenticeships. I think there's such a, a useful, uh, versatile actually tool <coughs> to be used in developing uh, the local economy. And uh, leaving aside the young people for a moment, I really would like us to see apprenticeships being available at all stages of life. Um, one of the things that perturbed me recently was to do a constituency case uh, where a young lad had uh, been in the army. He had come home. He wanted uh, to get an apprenticeship, but because he was 28, 29, he was too old for that apprenticeship. I don't want to see that situation pertaining in Northern Ireland for any longer. It doesn't matter where they've come from or who they are or anything else. Um, I think the opportunity to upskill and retrain at all stages of our lives is really very, very important. So I would like us to, to develop and use that apprenticeship tool. Um, I would also like us to see uh, investing more in uh, our Training for Success programmes Programs that take young people who are at times uh, have found education a difficult experience um, and uh, who need uh, help uh, to get onto that labour market uh, and who need to see a pathway for their lives. And I believe that if we are to build a stable future for Northern Ireland and for local um, communities, then I think that we must do more of that. Um, and uh, I think in, in some of the work that I've been doing in early work in the department before the destruction of COVID-19, uh, we were getting onto that pathway. I am absolutely determined that we open up opportunity for young people who otherwise will fall prey to evil men and women in our communities. And I think that that is really important for all of us. So um, we are um, starting to build that programme uh, of how we intervene and help young people throughout their lives, but also how we help people to change and reskill and adapt in, in other parts of their lives. Thank you, Minister. Chair, if I just come back on one point, um, people must think I've become obsessed with the health and beauty industry for the last two weeks because I never stopped talking about it. And I generally don't have fixation with fake tan, as you can tell by my milk bottle skin. But um, one of the sectors that is key to the employment of young women, of young people generally, of young entrepreneurs who decide to give up other careers and maybe open their own salons is the health and beauty sector. And whether it's our barbers or hairdressers or our talent studios or any of those salons, it is so vital to our local economy, to our local high streets, um, to give in flexible employment. And I know I, I wrote to you about that last week. They're crying out for some information on when they can get back to business as usual. And... We await announcement tomorrow, but I fear it might not even give the clarity that they need. Is there anything we can do for that sector? And I'll throw in as well driving instructors, because it's key to young people getting qualifications to get on the road as well. We need to get... There are some industries where two metres is never going to work. And we do accept the fact that we're going to have to get back and just suck it up and try to manage that and let those responsible companies do as much as they can to protect people or, or not. We need to give them some guidance and some clarity. And if could I implore you as the Minister here today on behalf of the Executive to give us that as quickly as possible, even if it's just the guidance about what they need to do when that date comes, because I really fear for that sector and for those people employed or currently not employed in that sector, Minister. A few things just to say about that sector, because I think it's really important. I talked earlier about young people going back into our colleges to do their assessments so that they can keep on working towards their career goals. Um, and of course, uh, one of the sectors that's really, really important to further education is that general health and, and, and beauty, even childcare sectors. So what we really need uh, to allow them, and I've said that, you know, as the economy opens up, each sector then can get back to college to actually 
progress their qualifications. So for me, in economy and in, in having a skills uh, policy um, responsibility, it's, it's really important as well from that point of view. Not something that anybody thinks about. I think, um, in general, um, most people will acknowledge um, that I've been pretty vocal about the need to reopen the economy um, because, you know, the longer we uh, are in lockdown, the more difficult it is for sectors and individual businesses to recover. I've said it many times, worth repeating, each month, month of shutdown is akin to a large recession of its own uh, of itself. So really important to get the economy reopened. I caveat everything with doing it safely. I agree with you. I think that we are going to have to learn to live with the virus and to work knowing that the virus is there. So therefore, what is really the most important thing to do is that work safe, stay safe slogan that we really need to ensure that we're respectful of each other in the environment that they're in and that employers have appropriate measures in to ensure that their workforce is safe as they go about their daily lives. So I, I agree with you. I think that it is important um, that we look at it in terms of two metres, one metre. I was up at Queen's last week um, and we had a really engaging conversation uh, with the Professor of Virology there, um, really engaging. And he, we were talking about, obviously, the two metre, one metre debate. Um, and he said, you know, well, for example, um, if you were outside at one metre, that is not as, as, as difficult as being inside at, as, at one metre. And sometimes it's also uh, the distance plus the mitigating measures that you put in place. So it's about good air circulation, it's about good hand hygiene, it's about how many people might be in your business at any one time. So it's about how you will operate. And I think we will all have to learn different operating <coughs> models um, as we go forward, uh, remembering um, that until we get a vaccine or a cure, or the, then we are going to have to learn to work with it. What we don't want is for business to forge ahead and have to take a step backwards. I think that would be an incredibly uh, frustrating and devastating blow um, to businesses across Northern Ireland and to communities across Northern Ireland who have sacrificed a lot of their own personal liberties uh, to try to help us in a difficult situation. So I'm, I'm in agreement with you. The general point that you make about the reopening is, is really is very important indeed. And I know that the executive are looking at how we can, uh, from here, take a more uh, overarching view, a more holistic view um, of how the different sectors uh, open and operate and the advice that we will give them. Um, and there will be more conversation around that uh, in, I think, on Thursday, actually, at the executive. I know that sector is ready and waiting to step up to whatever requirements are. But Trust can we me, expect John, I know. this minister is ready and waiting. <laughs> I know. We, can, we expect <laughs> can we expect some sort of announcement tomorrow, Minister, do you believe? Well, I, I wouldn't... Um, begin I, I i just won't speculate what the executive will do um i do know that there are uh, conversations around all of those areas but i do think that you know there are other areas that are waiting to f to find out um how they can open up and i know that today at 12 o'clock is the first meeting of the church's working group and as a person to whom faith is really important it is important to me that we find a way back for uh, people of faith and churches uh, to meet uh, within our communities. So there's a lot of work going on across all departments um, to try to, to work out how things will go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I'm just conscious of time and we have three more people asking questions. So we'll come Sorry. Up, Sorry. Um, as, as succinct as we can. Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Minister. I think most of the points have been well covered. Um, we welcome the experienced team that you have set up for the Economic Advisory Group. I think it's, you have a good, broad range of people, a number of them we know, and I think they will have a lot to offer. I do um, really recognise we have a long way to go. I think, you know, we've seen our towns and villages open up recently, but things are slow. Things, I think, lack confidence. There's a lack of confidence out there in, uh, in business and with the public, so I think we have a long way to go in recovery. 
Um, the other thing, FE colleges, and you've covered it very well. We had a good uh, discussion here with FE colleges. We all recognise the great work to do. There's been significant investment in FE colleges with a lot of new buildings. and There's a lot of people employed, um, and certainly the, the work goes on in the Sir College down in, in, a, in the North Down constituency is excellent. We look forward to bringing you down there sometime and meeting the principal, Ken Webb, who's very engaging. And uh, you'll be very welcome. But uh, the apprentice levy was a thing that is, was mentioned. Uh, a, a levy that's been has to be paid by a, a lot of businesses. And I understand the public sector as well. It's an issue that needs address. But um, uh, just to make you aware of that, my main point, I suppose, is one that I've gone on about before: is air connectivity and getting our airports up and running. And I know we have done some work on it, but I think it's so important. It's so important for business travel as well. As, as tourism, so many people fly in and out of, of our airport, as you well know, Minister, having been in Europe and so on. Uh, those airports are very important to viability of business. Public servants use them regularly in and out for day trips or for a couple of day trips. I think we need to get them up and running. We need to support them as much as we possibly can. And I think it's vital if we're going to get tourism back on track. This year is going to be very limited when we know that and we appreciate it, but I think a lot more needs to be done to try and support our airports and, and do what they can to help. And the other point, my last point, is just on Bombardier. We lost the jobs in Bombardier and we appreciate the work that has been done there. Uh, there's a real risk, and the, the points have been made well. There be, will be a, a lack of production Production is going to be limited within the next, say, this year, because the demand is not there in a lot of the manufacturing sector, and as a result, jobs will be lost. So we need to do all we can. To I think we need to encourage Invest NI to do more to change their role. We always seen Invest NI as supporting business, and they always had a, a, an emphasis on export, which we're all for. But I think now they need to change their role and the direction and support businesses that are struggling, Businesses that are going to have to diversify and are going to have to look at research and, and development and uh, other ways of working. So I think just a bit more emphasis, perhaps, on the work of Invest NI would be profitable. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I, first of all, um, the, of course, the apprenticeship levy is a national scheme yeah. um, that uh, we, we cannot simply deal with off our own. Um, and that uh, direction will come from national government. However, I think uh, you do understand, and I know that you will work with me um, in trying to extend the opportunity of apprenticeships uh, for young people in Northern Ireland. Um, and I mean apprenticeships at all levels and for all sectors. Um, I am very keen to extend those higher level apprenticeships, um, as I know uh, are some of our uh, premier companies um, and they offer real opportunity for young people who maybe don't want the university route uh, but will have very, very high levels of qualifications as they work their way through. Um, in terms of Bombardier, yes, um, it is uh, saddening to see uh, the job losses at Bombardier and indeed Thompson uh, Aerospace in my own constituency. Um, I think that these are reflective of uh, a global crisis um, in uh, the aerospace and airline industry. Um, I think I said it in the uh, ad hoc committee last week, um, Boeing and Airbus have announced a 40% reduction in uh, their uh, orders uh, in the industry, and that will have a knock-on effect uh, on those very big companies. But I do still worry very, very much about those smaller companies that actually supply into our larger companies. Yeah. And I think that they are vulnerable in that supply chain. Um, and because of that, um, I have asked uh, Invest NI, and I think this is an important role for them. Um, obviously, all of these uh, very large companies are uh, client companies of Invest, um, but I've asked them to bring, uh, to come together um, and uh, to bring in some of those supply chain uh, smaller manufacturers um, to look at what we can do in Northern Ireland, but most importantly, what we can ask of national government around uh, the aerospace industry. 
Um, I have a weekly call with Bayes, Minister Zahawi, on uh, this particular issue. And just two weeks ago, we had a dedicated call uh, with Bombardier uh, ar around uh, some of, not the redundancies, but the wider issues uh, around uh, the, the company and the aerospace industry in general. Um, and we will continue to do that. These are our flagship companies. They're very, very important to Northern Ireland's economy, and they're very important for very high-skilled, well-paid jobs in Northern Ireland. So very important uh, that we do. In terms of Invest, uh, Invest have uh, probably a broader and wider role than most people um, recognise, um, but um, they have been uh, busy uh, providing uh, the information, keeping the contact with companies, and we will work with them going forward to ensure um, that we have uh, a successful uh, Northern Ireland economy. Okay, Minister, just the airports. I know you've, oh, the you've worked on the airports. Sorry, I've yeah. forgotten something. Um, sorry, I, yeah. well, in, look, connectivity, connectivity, absolutely key, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, we need to ensure that we have it. Um, I think most people recognise that we have done a lot of work around that. Um, the PSO, the public supported route <coughs> between Aer Lingus, with Aer Lingus, uh, between here and London, um, was successful in supporting a route that was very, very vulnerable during the, the, the darker days of lockdown. We are beginning to see that opening up and, and more uh, flights uh, being there. I was delighted on Monday morning to be at the International Airport where they opened up their connectivity flights to the rest of GB, so the flights going to Liverpool, Manchester, Gatwick, um, and I think on Tuesday they had their first flight out to Faro. So it is absolutely key that we continue to support connectivity, not just for tourism, but for business and families as well. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Chair. So we have John and then Claire, if you can take two more questions. Uh, Minister, uh since 2007, um, I, I've sat and listened to DUP economy ministers uh, set out an economic strategy. And over those number of years, it has changed little. Uh, but at the very centre of it, and perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, you, you have extolled uh, the virtues of our relationship with Britain. You've extolled the virtues of trading with Britain. And of, there ha there, of course, there are virtues there. Uh, and I am not complaining about that. Uh, but I do have a concern when the sole focus of that economic strategy is our relationship with Britain. Whether you agree with that politically or not, but the sole strategy has been at times follow Britain or singly our focus is on Britain in terms of trade and economic activity to the expense of the benefits of working on an all-island basis on the North-South relationship and I think we are in danger of repeating that again. And when we look at, 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 at the figures of, of our economy, we have some of the lowest wages in these islands. We have the lowest standard of living compared to many regions of these islands. We have the lowest economic activity uh, compared to some of the regions in these islands. We have the lowest health outcomes of many of the regions in these islands. That would suggest to me that the strategy to date has failed. So why repeat it? Uh, and I asked the Minister, does she not think repeating the same strategy over and over again, particularly in light of COVID-19, will fail workers and their families, and in due course will then fail the economy? Do we not need a change of thinking? Well, I'm not really going to indulge in the political point, but I'm going to advise uh, the member um, very, very clearly that uh, one, in fact, our single biggest market, the market where we sell most to, the market <coughs> where we buy most from, is uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. So fundamental to our economic activity, to fundamental to businesses, fundamental to jobs and families in Northern Ireland, is our connection with that market. It is the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, it is our own internal market, so therefore it is fundamental to everything we do. And I make no apology for saying that as we uh, continue to see the outworkings 
uh, of uh, the negotiation with the European Union uh, and the implementation of the protocol that unfettered access to that really important market is uh, fundamental to the Northern Ireland economy. But John, I think you miss also the wider point that I've been making today. Um, and I, I think that it's worth repeating again. The vision that we have for Northern Ireland is of a Northern Ireland that can compete globally, that can invest in specific sectors, that can actually um, build on the expertise and world-class uh, work that we're already doing um, and build on that to be globally competitive in those particular sectors. That is also important. And I suppose to finish uh, on, on this particular point, I, um, as the economy minister, of course uh, connect with my counterparts right across the British Isles um, in tourism and in various other sectors. Uh, and of course, when there is a new government uh, in the Republic of Ireland, we'll connect with my counterparts there as well so that we can continue to make sure that we prosper and grow as a region. I just want to make one quick point of clarification to one of Sinead's questions. I will return to the previous subject many times in the future, no doubt. In response to Sinead's questions in relation to the underspend for business support, you said you would be bringing a paper to the executive. Will that paper include recommendations to support those businesses who have not yet received support and the small traders? Will you make those specific recommendations to the executive? Um, as I have said on many, many occasions uh, around this particular issue, I will bring a comprehensive paper to the executive. The executive will then have a discussion uh, and decide uh, what uh, that underspend, uh, what should happen with it uh, and where it should uh, be uh, divested. I will then work with executive colleagues to ensure that it is uh, delivered in the way that the executive has indicated. But the executive will be led by yourself. It will be led by your recommendations. So it's key that you make those recommendations. Well, the executive will always take a view, John. It will always take a view. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister. Um, this is really to follow on with, um, from a lot of what John had said in relation to things reopening up again. And you know, certainly uh, the announcement on Monday were very much welcome, particularly in my constituency, where tourism is the focus our local economy. Um, I suppose where um, every time we make a new announcement it gives rise to many questions and many variances and you know a, a lot of confusions and I, I would expect most MLAs around this table in, in connecting with their constituents have been getting queries subsequent to those announcements on Monday. I suppose we're almost at a phase now where we're trying to decide when the rest of the businesses can open um, and, and services and when they can begin again and I suppose as, a, as a, an executive you're making decisions on the basis of medical evidence and you're, you're probably considering it in terms of what types of businesses have uh, contact with the transfer of the virus um, uh, but there's also something in relation to water droplets within the air which is determining why some you know uh, can't maybe open before others. So I suppose really that, that's where the problems are coming from for me. And I know some of these areas may fall into other ministers' remits, but insofar they are businesses in themselves. So I, I, I'm going to give you a list. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I don't necessarily expect um, a response on each of those, but just to give you my views on that and, and to, to represent the constituents that have come to me. So dentists and opticians um, are, are quite concerned because whilst dentists and opticians seem to go into the sphere of health, in most cases, they are private business organisations, and indeed, even the subsidies that they're receiving from the Department of Health are not, you know, going to even touch the PPE that that they are um, going to need to operate again. So th there is a business consideration for them, you know, that I would like to you take a view of. Uh, personal trainers and um, uh, sports coaches, you know, they're telling me that you know if they compare themselves to some of the other businesses that have been able to open then um, you know, that they could very much put in place um, two meter distancing, one if that's what it becomes, you know, they could do it outside and all of that, but they just need that affirmation from the minister or the executive to say that they need to be able to open. Coach operators is another. Indoor soft play areas, um, you know, is there, is there a consideration around that? Another one's bookmakers, I'm getting that from, you know, I suppose I can't really un um, understand why they haven't been able to open. And there's an interesting point a number of people had said to me, 
if they are not able to do that activity you know, in, a, in a physical space, they are seeking to do it online, and it's causing them to do it more often than not. So I nearly wonder, is there a consideration there just in terms of reopening that so that we don't give rise to other um, uh, issues at, at, into that? And weddings as well. You know, we're hearing the numbers on that increase, and that can be done outdoors. It's a huge industry, so not just for people getting married, but you know, for, for all the different... Uh, uh, vendors across Northern Ireland, and I, I think you know if we are starting to open up and we are starting to um, enable businesses to get back to, to work, I think it's these types of um, uh, these are almost the last groupings. And I nearly wonder, you know, should we do this as a flow diagram? You know, if your business, <laughs> if you're able to operate with your consumers, you know, at a two meter basis, then potentially you could open, and then it takes it to the next level. To next level, do you have aerosols within your you know, enclosed space and that type of thing? So just we can give clarity. I just. I'm personally frustrated that you know, we get good announcements and then you know, we have all these wonderful people coming to me and saying, you know, actually, does this apply to me? And I, I think it's just about giving that reassurance. Um, we've talked about the city deals. Um, I suppose what leads on to that from the growth deal as well, and where Causeway Coast and Glen sits on that. Um, uh, an official previously had said to this committee that Causeway Coast and Glen seems to be not as further on as maybe the other regions. In Northern Ireland, and I'd be keen to know how you guys are elected rep, or you know, we, we, we could support them in doing that. And the last one, and um, we'll maybe go into this more whenever we have people presenting to us. Um, we were due a presentation um, in respect of adults with learning uh, disabilities and how we can support them in getting back to work. Again, I appreciate this probably extends into the health minister's remit. I'm getting a lot of contact from uh, parents um, uh, about, about their dependents. And saying that they are um, finding difficulty and being able, to, you know, just this lockdown situation, and they're quite keen to understand when they could get back to this. And I know being employed for those individuals is also an, uh, is an important part of that. So, in a nutshell. That's uh, quite a list. <laughs> but anyway, I'm, I'm going to take the first bit and I'm going to group it together mm -hmm. because I, I, I think that that's, that's Im important. Um, I think you're right. I think that we've had our first uh, tentative steps of opening up the economy. Um, we've made significant progress. Um, retail is operating, hospitality and tourism will be able to operate in a limited way, but an important uh, first step to try to get uh, them on that road to recovery, really, really important first step. Um, and as I said uh, in answer to an earlier question, I think it is time to look at those sectors that are specifically mentioned in the regulations uh, and to see how those can be opened up safely. And that will require a uh, holistic view from the executive as a whole. Many of them, as you say, are not my policy remit, um, but sometimes tangentially become part of my policy remit. Um, but uh, so we really want to see how that we can bring clarity and structure to that as a whole. And we'll have that discussion on uh, Thursday and see how that fits in with that recovery plan for the executive. And I think it's really important to get to that. Um, the city deals, I'm going to allow Dermot to, to look at that. But can I just say a little bit around uh, the issue um, of adults with learning disabilities? I think it is massively important, I think, to get um, education back on track. I think it's an enormous disservice to young people if uh, we continue uh, where we are. I, I'm, I'm very, my background, I am a teacher by trade. My, my background, uh, everything about me indicates that, that it's really crucial and important. But it's ever more important for people uh, with learning disabilities, and particularly adults. Um, so trying to get those training centres opened um, successfully and safely um, and to try to give uh, some hope and perhaps a little bit of a break to those people who are now caring 24-7 and have been doing so for a very long time. Um, I think that you've hit on one of the um, areas of lockdown that has caused um, so much, you know, disturbance and um, really stress to families as, as they try to go forward. And I think that's a really important thing to try to get done as quickly as we can. Uh, very briefly on, on the Causeway Coast and Glens, uh, uh, we haven't had active engagement with Causeway Coast and Glens at this stage. Uh, I think you have to bear in mind and remember that these are, the city deals are being 
owned and designed and developed and driven by the councils. That was the, that is the model that they're operating on. It's not they're not driven from the centre. And we will come in and support mm -hmm. uh, and work with them when they have their their package together. Obviously, in relation to the the mid south west, they had their growth strategy work done previously, and that's the basis on which they are now looking at the areas they want to focus their growth deal on. And I assume that the Causeway Coast and Glens are doing a similar piece of work internally within the Council, looking at their own growth strategy for the area, the areas where they have strengths and capabilities. And when they have thought and done their, their thinking at a, a Council level, then they will engage with the relevant departments, be that ourselves on tourism or innovation and digital, be it uh, DFC on regeneration. Or, but I think we need to give them the space to come forward with what is their thinking, what is their focus for their deal, and then we will roll in uh, and work with them when, when they have a clear path going forward, rather than us trying to sort of dictate a path to them. No, I understand that. Do we have any concerns that they aren't pressing that as quickly as a group so that they don't miss the opportunities there? Or um, is it just, you know, you feel that they are still working through the space? Um, you know, will there come a point when we do need to intervene and encourage them and, and, and try and get this over the line so that we can... Um, the wider yeah, I mean, I, th I'm j I can't answer the question. Yeah. I just don't know where they are within their own process internally. Um, we haven't proactively gone seeking information from them. Um, Is that something you could do? Uh, well, obviously, if, it's pro if they want us to invite us, we will certainly come and talk to them. I mean, the Mid and South West did reach out to us, and we were down with them uh, and met with the um, chief executives of the councils involved when they were starting off their thinking and asked us to give us uh, give them their our, our experience of what had happened in the previous two deals, and then they took that on board when they were starting to look at what they were going to do. They're aware of what's happening in the other two deals. We, equally, if the Causeway Coastal Glens want to uh, interact with us on what we've been doing in the other deals, we're happy to do so. Thank you very much, and I know we've kept you again, so apologies for that, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us, and I'm sure we'll have you back as soon as we can. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, folks. Really Take care. care. <laughs> thank you. Right, thank you. Um, so thank we'll you move on. Thank you. We'll move on then to um, our next. Wait, oh, sorry, we have a couple of items of business to do. Let's, if we just move to the briefing, then we'll, we'll come back, come back to those. To um, okay, we'll move on then. Um, so we're having our next briefing by teleconference and, uh, from Northern Ireland Union of Supported Employment um, on the future funding for disability employment projects and an update on the impact of COVID-19. There is a clerk's memo at page 147 <laughs> of your pack. They're all relevant. There are biographies of the representatives at page 149. A briefing paper at page 151, a briefing paper regarding future funding at page 153, a briefing paper on disability employment at page 169, and a series of case studies at page 185. So I'd like to welcome to the meeting Norman Sterrett, um, Chair of NIUSE, David Babington, Chief Executive of Action Mental Health, Margaret Kelly, um, Director of MenCap, and um, Stephen Matthews, Chief Executive of the Cedar Foundation. Um, if you would like to make an opening statement, if you cannot, are you all on the line okay and can you hear us okay? Yes, good, good morning. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the members of the, the Economic Committee for, for meeting with us today uh, and uh, enabling us to raise this issue about future funding for disability employment services uh, and the impact that COVID-19 is having on, on the sector. Um, uh, just by, by way of a, an introduction, I know you've gone through it. I, I do have on the line with me today my colleagues, Margaret Kelly from Mencap, uh, David Babbitton from Action Mental Health, uh, and Stephen Matthews from the Cedar Foundation. Um, just before I invite Margaret Kelly to, to provide a, a little bit of a brief overview of, of the key actions uh, within the paper that, that we provided the committee with, um, I'd like to give you a little bit of background into, into NIUS, the Northern Ireland Union of Support and Employment, uh, which is a, an umbrella organisation representing individuals and organisations uh, that provide employment opportunities for disabled people and those from other disadvantaged situations. 
Uh, NIUS promotes the model of supported employment uh, as, an inter as an employment intervention uh, and assists uh, disabled people to access, stay and progress in employment, uh, providing a per person-centred approach uh, and ongoing support to both the job seekers uh, and employers. Um, uh, support employment is a, an internationally recognised model uh, which has been delivered across Northern Ireland over the last 25 years. Uh, the model has also been recognised in the Northern Ireland uh, Employment Strategy for People with Disabilities as the preferred model uh, and intervention <coughs> for disabled people to access, stay and progress within employment. The main source of funding supporting the work of our members uh, has been the uh, ESF, the European uh, uh, Programme, which is administered through the Department of the Economy. Um, and I'd like to commend colleagues within the ESF Managing Authority at this stage who have been very supportive and flexible with organisations, uh, particularly during this present COVID-19 situation. The strategic aim of the ESF programme in, in Northern Ireland is to combat poverty uh, and enhance social inclusion by reducing economic inactivity uh, and to increase the skill base of those currently in work and future potential participants in the workforce. Uh, and it provides a, a vital uh, uh, funding for long uh, for long term unemployed, for ex offenders, uh, for the needs groups, and uh, also for disabled people. Uh, disabled people are one of the most economically inactive groups and uh, face significant barriers uh, when trying to access employment. Uh, people with disabilities are twice as likely to be unemployed as non disabled people, and in Northern Ireland, the employment gap between disabled and non-disabled people is the highest in the UK. Only 35% of working age disabled people uh, are in employment uh, within Northern Ireland in comparison to between 45 and 50% in, in, in GB. So with the potential economic re uh, recession that, that you know, may well follow the, the COVID recovery situation, disabled people are going to be further disadvantaged uh, in accessing employment, uh, and government needs to take action to ensure that disabled people are not forgotten about and, uh, you know, are, are appropriately supported to find employment. Um, the, the ESF uh, programme provides a, a funding lifeline uh, to those uh, that are furthest removed from the labour markets to, insist their, uh, to assist their progression into education, training and employment. There are currently 22 ESF-funded projects under the ESF disability theme, uh, with 55% of the funding provided from, uh, from ESF, 10% uh, from the Department of the Economy, and the remaining 35% uh, from a range of match funding organisations, typically government departments, uh, Department of Economy, Health and Social Care Trusts, uh, councils, FE sector, and, and other private sources. Um, ESF funding will come to an end in March 2022, uh, which is really just 20 months away. And typically, our experience has been it takes three to four years to develop a, a replacement program, so we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Um, the UK government committed to, to keep in place current ESF arrangements until they expire in 2022, and also to create a successor fund to, to that. Uh, this proposed new UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which operates across the whole of the UK, uh, we are told will serve a similar purpose to the existing European Structural and Investment Funds, of which ESF is one. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, have consulted and launched a report on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, and the Welsh Assembly are currently consulting. However, we're unaware um, where we are with regards to Northern Ireland and our consultation on, on, this, on, this, key, uh, on this key program. Um, 16 of our NIUS members have come together uh, to set up a policy group to highlight the impact uh, of the end of the ESF programmes uh, and to seek some clarification on the new funding arrangements for the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, the new <coughs> NIUS policy group produced a, a, brief paper, a briefing paper entitled Future Funding for Disabled Disability Employment Services uh, back in June of 2019, uh, which identified the key concerns and actions. Uh, the policy group um, has met and raised our concerns uh, with officials across a number of government departments, uh, with the Department uh, for the Economy, Department of Communities, Department of Health, uh, Department of Finance. 
Um, and the issues that, that we all face now have become further compounded, of course, by the <coughs> COVID-19 uh, and the uncertainty for the future, both socially and economically. Uh, and we've come to the committee today as a matter of urgency to, to raise these, these, these uh, issues, basically, and, and to urge action. I'd like to pass over now to, to my colleague, Margaret Kelly, who, who will outline some of the key issues and actions highlighted within the briefing paper. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Norman. Good morning, everybody. And I'm just checking that you can hear me OK? Yeah. Yep. OK, thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over just some of the really key areas and some of the actions that we would like to ask the committee to consider and support us with. So I think it's really important to say that in the last two years, the um, members of the Now Youth Group have supported over 6,500 disabled people across 22 different projects. And that 17.5% of those people progressed into paid employment. And that that, by a long margin, exceeds the 10% target that was set by ESF. Um, of those, 54% remained in their paid employment after six months. And the further, almost 20% had progressed into training and education on leaving the programme. So I think the programme's been running for quite a long number of years. It's a critical and essential programme, but it also has been delivering some really good outcomes. And I would emphasise that this programme works with that group of people who are absolutely furthest from the labour market. The level of employment for those with a disability of working age in Northern Ireland is 35%. And in Britain, it is between 45 and 50%. And I would also just highlight that if you look at adults with a learning disability, the highest, so there's some a lack of figures, but the highest figure anywhere in Britain for adults with a learning disability in employment is 17% but often typically more like 9%. So the projects are working with a group of people who are very far from the employment market and are having some real success in supporting them. But as with everything else, that success depends on having programmes that can continue to operate and that are funded and are work well. Um, I noticed that the Minister raised the issue of adults with a learning disability um, at the very end of her comments. And without doubt, adults with a learning disability and children and children with disabilities in general have been really disproportionately impacted by COVID. And they are at much higher risk of poorer social, economic and health outcomes. They are much more likely to experience isolation and loneliness. And that had a direct impact on their mental health. Many people with a disability have needed to shield and self-isolate um, during COVID and will probably need to continue to do so while the virus remains. Many of those who have a disability who go into employment tend to work in the hospitality and retail sectors. And those are two, as the committee will know, of the worst affected sectors. So it is really important when considering both the future of ESF, the future of funding, but also the impact of COVID to note that those with a, disabil with a disability were twice as likely to remain unemployed as those without. So it is really key that government works together with the organisations to work collaboratively and tackle the really significant challenges that COVID-19 has posed for those who are most vulnerable and disadvantaged. And when we add to that the fact that the disability employment services who are funded almost entirely through ESF along with other departments might come to an end in 2022, then that has a really critical impact for people's life chances and emotional well-being. So as a group, there are a number of key actions that we are asking both the committee to consider, but also government to consider. So we feel that there needs to be a strategy and an action plan to support disabled people into training and employment that 
following the labour market disruption that has been caused by COVID-19. And I know there are huge pressures around COVID-19, but people with a disability will have suffered disproportionately and it will make their getting into employer employment harder. We need some fairly urgent clarification of future funding arrangements for disability employment programmes that are currently delivered through ESS. And we need an insurance that there will be no gap between the existing and new funding. So all of the staff that all of the organisations currently employ are looking at about 18 months left on contracts with absolutely no idea how or whether those programmes are going to continue. All of those adults with learning disabilities six and disabilities 6,500 have no idea in 18 months whether or not their programmes are going to be there. We think there needs to be a necessary transition period which will see the current ESF programme and the delivery mechanisms that underpin it extended for a minimum three-year period. We feel that too much time has elapsed to develop a suitable replacement before the end of March. And given the additional challenges that COVID-19 has presented to the labour market, we believe that it is better to continue with a tried, tested and proven programme that would ensure some um, stability for disabled people in terms of accessing training and employment. We think that there must be some powers to allocate funding through the UK Shared Prosperity Fund that respects Northern Ireland's devolved status and responsibility for social inclusion and economic development, rather than that being held at the centre. We think that it is critically important that the new funding at least matches the current total ESF resources that has been provided and that there is some future proofing for inflation. And we believe that it is also critically important that disabled people are consulted directly on the priorities that the new um, UK Shared Prosperity Fund or any alternative funding um, will provide, because actually there is nothing better than the lived experience and the lived voice for letting <coughs> government know what really needs to happen. But I think most urgently of all, we are very concerned that in other jurisdictions there has been consultation already undertaken and we are unaware of any consultation. And for us and for all of the people we support, time is really ticking. So we would really appreciate the committee's help and support on it. Thank you. Um, th thank you both for your presentations and for um, bringing this, these issues to, to our attention. I think it is really, really important that, that we do pick up on the issues that you have highlighted. Now, um, I think all of us have a responsibility in terms of um, our PFG commitments around tackling um, inequalities and ensuring inclusion. Um, and obviously the impact of COVID-19 um, has been profound. Um, I, I think we are probably all are aware of ESF projects that are doing really amazing work um, in terms of supporting people with disabilities and into employment and, and training opportunities and that very personalised intervention that, that you have talked about. Um, in terms of the particular impact of, of COVID-19, as you've highlighted, the sectors impacted um, and the, the jobs that, that disabled people are um, probably are more likely to go into, but also the role of um, the social economy is one that we have highlighted as a committee um, that plays a really important role in terms of supporting um, the, um, our, our communities as well. Um, so in terms of the, um, the work that has gone on to date, around the Shared Prosperity Fund, um, has there been any um, um, contact or uh, working with departments around shaping that um, replacement uh, funding? Maybe I could direct the question to, to, to David, David Babington. Uh, David, would you like to pick this one up? Good afternoon, everyone. It's David Babington here. I'm Chief Executive of Action Mental Health, and I hope you can all hear me. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to talk through these issues. In terms of, of engagement so far on uh, UK Shared Prosperity Fund, or indeed any other new programme, um, we have made inquiries um, to the Department for Economy and the Department for Communities. 
However, any details are very sketchy. And I think this is one of the problems that goes to the core of where we are now, why why we're really talking to you with such urgency, is that we need some strategic leadership, I believe, in terms of who has control of this, who is going to take charge of this. We have the Department for Economy, we have the Department for Communities, and also the we believe the Department for Finance um, has some interest in this as well. And then with respect to disability organisations, in particular our much funded, the Department for Health as well. And there seems to be no sort of coordination of the needs and interests of those departments, and no one coming forward with a, a really good idea as to what the future holds. What, what I, I, I emphasise what Margaret did say there already, in terms of what the, the current programme is in place. I sit on the Programme Monitoring Committee, which meets um, every two months, uh, every six months rather, and that's under the chairmanship of the Department for Finance. And the current programme is held up as the benchmark in Europe. It is the, the gold-plated programme which actually delivers for people on the ground. Indeed, they're, they're showing what we do here in Northern Ireland, showcasing it in places like Eastern Europe and whatever, and department officials are going over to showcase what we do do. So it is a great success what is being done now. And the great concern is what, what is so good here now that all the infrastructure and databases and reporting, which is all set up, will now be just thrown uh, to one side. And indeed, there's so many good lessons to be drawn from the current programme. I think if I can draw your attention back to... 2015, uh, I don't think some of you were around then, but in 2015, at the start of Core 1, uh, there were a change to the existing ESF program. Uh, and that was done really within the umbrella of ESF, but it caused chaos for 18 months. And it meant that the department had to basically fund organizations who were effectively getting no funding at all. And it caused a lot of people to be having a trail up to storm and speaking to Stephen Farry, the minister there as well. So even a small adjustment to a program, which is already within ESF, caused enormous problems. And our great concerns here are, is that here we are within 18 months, 20 months or so out from a new program, and there's still no sense to what is going to be happening. I think that the specific issues that you have highlighted there around the department involvement um, and who takes the lead and, and how that is going to be developed out is something we'll take up specifically um, from today's meeting to the ministers and perhaps highlight to the other committees as well. Yep. All right, thank you. Um, Gary? Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks for the presentation. Um, it, it's clear that uh, from your briefing that um, you know, the, this uh, really uh, affects those with uh, disabilities, uh, particularly COVID, and, and you've highlighted a lot of the uh, actions and the issues which are uh, facing the sector, uh, particularly in the short term, but also in the long term. Uh, and I think back just to uh, earlier in this year, uh, when, when within my own constituency, the Destin Group, uh, or the Northwest Learning uh, Disability Centre, was was attacked and it was vandalised and I can remember visiting the scene with other elected reps and seeing the devastation and the impact that that had on those individuals that used that property uh, and, I, and I know that that's a similar feeling in terms of not being able to attend their workplaces uh, and for, for many of those individuals it's, um, you know, it, it's key in terms of their mental well-being and just the fact that they want to make a contribution to society like everyone uh, uh, so, so, so I very much understand that. I, I wanted to just ask a question around, I appreciate that many of those with disabilities will have been shielding over the COVID period, but as businesses start to reopen, are there any experiences currently or feedback from uh, individuals with disabilities who have been able to get back into the workplace? Is there any feedback from them? Um, Norman, would you mind if I answered? Oh, please do, Margaret, sir. Yeah. Thanks very much for the question, Gary. Actually, we have had a number of people with a learning disability who have continued to work throughout the COVID pandemic. So they have been working in retail in particular, and many of them have continued to go in, whether that was packing shelves or doing deliveries. Um, and that has been really critically important for them and their well-being. And I would like to highlight that contribution that they've made. Um, there has, employers are beginning to make some efforts um, to get people back in. And I have to say, I think people with disabilities are as anxious to get back to their place of employment as many other people who have had to be furloughed. And I think there is some really good practice out there not just in terms of returning after COVID, but also really good practice from employers who have supported people with disabilities into employment and the difference that that's made in their lives. So I think if we can continue to have the right support, it is very possible for people to get back and to continue to work and to find their way into the workplace. I think the problem is, as I'm sure you will understand, that without programmes like this, 
and sufficient funding and a secure, a secure future, that becomes very difficult. Thank you. Norman, can I, can I just add to that, please, Stephen? Yes. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, Stephen Matthews here, Chief Executive of uh, Cedar Foundation. Um, uh, we provide a range of, of support programs across Northern Ireland, um, uh, supported uh, over 1,000 people over the last two years of the program. I think one, one of the points, just to sort of emphasise what, what um, um, David uh, and, and Margaret uh, um, uh, and Norman have said, is that um, many of these projects um, are, are particularly focused on supporting employers. Um, it's not just uh, that they, they, they provide services in a social economy. Um, it's the actual structure and the nature of, of many of the interventions is through the supported employment model, is engaging directly with employers to open up those opportunities. But whenever the, the jobs are in place, it's about that ongoing engagement, the practical support um, to ensure that there's a long-term sustainability. Um, and the, the kind of situations that Margaret has just referred to really exemplify the effectiveness of, of the programme. And it's one of the reasons why um, you know, we have been very, very successful, certainly in getting people into employment. But in comparison to many other programmes, um, it, it, there's been exceptional level of success in, in keeping people in, in jobs once um, they, um, we've been able to get them there in the first place. And certainly the experience um, in terms of uh, uh, all those programmes, both in terms of mental health and learning disability or brain injury, is that um, ongoing partnership and engagement uh, with employers is really the key to this whole approach. Um, and that's certainly the, the whole um, essence of the model of, of supported employment. And the uh, European Social Fund has been really instrumental in building and developing that across Northern Ireland. And therefore, it's absolutely critical that we get some kind of a sustainable um, way forward that is not just about supporting those individuals, but it's also about supporting employers meeting their statutory obligations in terms of meeting the needs of uh, that Section 75 grouping. Okay. Thank you, and I'm glad um, that you highlighted the fact that you know many of those individuals with disabilities have been uh, out on the front front line and and are very much key workers. So we applaud them for that, uh, and I'm delighted that you've been able to, to air that today. Um, I think we're getting a clear message that what has been going on has been uh, successful. It's been productive. Um, but there's a real concern that there's a funding issue coming down the line. So I think as a committee, um, you know, w w no doubt the chair will discuss this in terms of getting clarity as to who's the lead, how, uh, who would take the, the strategy forward, who would develop the strategy. Um, but certainly, you, you know, you, you have my support and, and I wish you well and I look forward to uh, continuing the, the conversations over the next number of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks everyone for your presentation. Norman, David, Margaret, and Stephen. David, I'm sure you're particularly pleased about the mental health champion being appointed. I know you've worked very strongly on that for a number of yes, years. It, 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 absolutely. If I may add as well, the fact there is a mental health action plan, a COVID response plan, a champion, and a strategy coming, um, and we're, we are very, very pleased uh, in, in, the, in the sector. Good, and obviously you need the funding to follow. But um, yes, and we do recognise all the good work that you do for people with disability who, in many cases, are, are left behind. Um, how do you feel that they've been treated uh, during the lockdown period in relation to inclusion, say, in the, in the furlough scheme? I've been aware of some harsh decisions in relation to that. I don't know what evidence you have in relation to that issue. Well, actually... Uh one of, the, one of the key aspects of uh, Stephen has alluded to in terms of the model is that, that long-term ongoing relationship building with employers. Uh, on the ground, we're finding our employment officers, um, in, in terms of those individuals that have been furloughed, there, there's a big piece of work to do around uh, making sure that we appropriately advocate for those individuals so that they're treated fairly and they're treated in an appropriate manner. Uh, by and large, uh, as I say, the relationships that we build with employers are, are long term. Uh, we've had uh, some instances where we've been working well over 10 years with certain employers uh, and we, there's a degree of a trust that, that would build up uh, between us. So in, in terms of that ongoing making sure that we advocate for people, it's a key aspect of the, of the model. Okay, yes, thanks for that. I think we're all aware too that special schools are still closed, which is a major issue 
for families and I know we're under pressure to get something done on it within the, the North Town area. I, I notice one of the points here, in barriers to employment talks about um, the lack of flexible personalised personalised employment programmes. Is that still an ongoing issue and is that something that we should, I suppose, push on in relation when we're dealing with employers and we're talking to employers to try and get a more flexible programmes set up for people with disability? Well, well I guess the, the, the European Social Fund and, and the voluntary community sector that largely avail of that and, and, and uh, fulfil that gap is, is really what we're, what we're addressing today. Uh, mainstream programmes do tend to be a little bit more problematic uh, for, the, for those very far from the labour market and uh, probably not specialised enough. Um, naturally, a, a one-size-fits-all um, solution is, isn't easily achievable. Uh, but by and large, I, I kind of think that w what we're talking about in terms of the ESF programmes is, is the, 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 the programmes that pick up the individuals that fall through the gaps of mainstream programmes. Okay. Could I, could I just make, make a point there as sure. well, Norman, if I might mm -hmm. uh, uh, share as well? Um, I, I think uh, w one of the key things about the ESF-funded uh, programmes in terms of outcomes that many of us target it's not just employment-based, but it's really acquisition of skills and ability to get into the mainstream programs like Training for Success or Workable. Um, you know, the rationale behind that is really that uh, we're, it, it, the work that we're doing is about progression. And um, if we can get people into those um, mainstream programs, we will do that. Um, and that's the flexibility of the, um, the supported employment model. It's really about that long-term progression across all those areas. And as Norman highlighted, you know, we tend to pick up those individuals who are economically inactive further from the labour market. But there's always a progressive element. And um, it's not about trying to um, uh, replace any existing programme. It's about being supplementary to um, and uh, supportive of those. And I think that's one of the real strengths of, of the model of practice that we have. Okay, thanks everyone, and yes, we will obviously uh, discuss this issue later on, and we will, I'm sure, all be supportive of trying to ensure the proper funding is in place come March 2022. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. Um, Sinead? Okay, thank you very much for your briefing um, so far, and as a collective uh, body, you have certainly done a great deal of work, and, uh, and um, you have every right to be concerned about your future funding and, and, and um, you need clarity and stability of it. But um, as you said, the work that you have done with on, under the ESF has been exemplary, uh, and, and we need to ensure and guarantee that we can um, get the funding stream going. Uh, after March 2022. So I think everybody in the committee here will uh, be very supportive of that. And I suppose moving just on to COVID, um, COVID has brought up its own problems uh, in additional in additional to the, the ones that you had previously in relation to the where the, the, where the funding is coming. And I suppose whenever um, bodies are the furthest away from employment and, and, and another crisis hits, it's uh, another impact. Um, it's very difficult to kind of COVID-19 um, secure your, 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 your bodies, but have you thought of what additional resources that you may need over and above what you currently um, have had because of COVID? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, I, I'm working with um, what they call the regional uh, mental health and wellbeing silver cells. So from a mental health perspective, uh, certainly there are uh, gaps that are being looked at now by that silver cell to see where interventions need to be made to support people. Such things as sort of low-level interventions such as talking therapies and variations of that to help people take a step out and potentially think about moving away from being in lockdown and maybe moving into some of our programmes or, we, or even those people who are currently on the programmes. I might say, though, that uh, we did a survey um, last week of um, uh, our recovery clients, and obviously about 1,000 who are under uh, in, in our programs at the moment, 740 responded. And 
90% of them wanted to have face-to-face -face engagement. They wanted to break out of the lockdown. I think that probably just shows that they, you know, that, that the longer the lockdown goes on, the more issues that are going to appear. So I think that uh, the, the easing of the lockdown in itself will play a very positive part in trying to help people with mental health issues and general well-being throughout the population. And I think the programme that the ESF and provides that, allows that sort of tailored, personalised approach, allows us to input with extra resources if they are available. Norman, could I maybe just come in on that? Certainly, Margaret. Um, I think one of the areas that does need to be considered is actually young people um, with disabilities of like 16 plus. And unfortunately, it is actually still the case that many young people and parents describe the move from children services to adult services as a cliff edge and in particular those young people have been out of school out of routine out of learning and i think there's a real piece of work to be done around ensuring that we are considering that particular group of young people with a disability or a learning disability and how we are supporting them back because they will have much higher levels of anxiety that transition back will be much more difficult for them. And I know because we've been in contact with many families um, and we've had some research that says for many, many of those families, they have had no services and no support for the last 10 to 12 weeks. So I think there is, there is also a piece of work that is about those young people of 16 plus and really working with them focused on where are they going in terms of training and employment. And that will have been negatively impacted um, by COVID in, in a situation where they already get very little support with that. I think maybe too, as, as services sort of have their experience has been that they've moved away, um, not, not completely, but to, to a large degree from the face-to-face -face online uh, to online provision and the, the big challenges that we, we have been finding particularly with learning disability uh, clients is, is that that digital divide is there um, there's there's a there's a big big uh, issue around their their ability to to, to actually utilize uh, online provision uh, as an alternative and again we, we did a survey of, of, of many of the participants that we work with and uh, it was surprising just how little we're comfortable with utilising that uh, that on, online uh, provision as opposed to face to face. Face to face was really what what they were looking for, what they're comfortable with, and uh, what what helps them learn best. Norm, if I, if I could just kind of come in, Thank um, you. Uh, Chair, Chair, if, you, if you're happy enough, I think one of the um, I mean, as Norman has said at the very outset, um, the very nature of the ESF programmes. If you look at the funding mix. Um, that comes in across uh, the majority of, of projects. Um, they are reflective uh, of a kind of a whole person approach, a whole government approach, both in terms of support from the Department of Economy, uh, Department of Communities, Health and Social Care, and that often reflects the nature of the intervention. Uh, and if you look certainly um, at the, uh, many of the issues, particularly in relation to, to young people, Margaret touched on the whole, uh, the importance of effective transitions. I mean, we're, we're now engaged in um, a recovery program, and uh, there's a lot of discussions that are happening, um, particularly with uh, health and social care trusts and how we're starting to move away from the, the kind of remote uh, working uh, to actual look into engagement, because it's not just the impact on the individual in terms of trying to move them into you know, socially um, and economically active activity. It's the impact in terms of those young people and their families and the consequences of, um, of lockdown. Uh, Chair, and you, you talked about the need for additional resources. I think that's very much where any additional resources, let alone the security of the ESF program, will have to look. And I know certainly um, there is a real, there, there are op opportunities, and, and it's very welcome that funds have been made available through, um, through the executive end to, um, to be administered by the Community Foundation and Big Lottery. I think those are the kind of things that, that will be increasingly important. But fundamentally, it's the stability of the European social funded uh, programs across the disability sector and the uncertainty of all of that. We desperately, desperately need some kind of certainty in terms of the future direction and support. Um, and then we can start to build upon those other additional, additional needs. Thank you very much for answering those questions. And I suppose whenever um, the remit 
uh, falls across multiple departments. It's always hard to actually get um, who takes the lead in it. So that's probably something that we'll talk about afterwards as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, look, thank you very much for that and for, as I said previously, um, highlighting these, uh, these issues to us. Um, and we will pick them up and um, raise them with the, with the various departments and committees as well. So thank you very much for your time this morning, or afternoon now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Chair, the action I have, if members are content, is, is writing to the Minister uh, in terms of seeking strategic leadership across the range of departments, flagging up the issues that have been identified uh, on page 181 of the main pack um, in the presentation that had been given to us. Um, also then copying that to the committees that have also got a relevant view here, um, finance, communities and health. Would it not be education as well? Education too. Um, but also um, reflecting some of the, the additional issues that have been raised there around, and it, it's, it's one that has been an issue long term uh, around the gap between child uh, provision and adult provision, um, where consistency of routine is incredibly important. But there's a huge move there, and there's often a big gap, and it's, it's trying to create that to be much smoother. Also, uh, the issue that I think a lot of members are aware of there, that lockdown um, for some families has meant no access to support and services, mm -hmm. and that in, in a lot of cases that's, that's now on doing work that's already been done, the progress that has already been made. So if members are content, Good. Um, we write on that basis. Yep, thank you. Great, great. Um, if we can just go back to item number four, there was a couple of actions to um, pro progress as well. Um, there are letters at page, um, at page 26 of your table papers um, from Social Enterprise, and I regard the continued lack of support and then there is um, uh, correspondence page 30 of your table pack from the Northern Ireland Turf Guardians Association and someone already mentioned that we open a betting shop but we had communication about that um, earlier in the week as well. So are members content that we forward those um, on to owner of Miss Fund, the, the British Dental Association as yeah. well? Well, that was also mentioned too. Thank you. Um, at page 143 of your original pack mm -hmm. so members content that we forward all of those on to the department for responses yep. great thank you okay sure. then moving on to item number six which is matters arising there is a ministerial response at page 195 with an update on the establishment of the tourism recovery steering group um, and working group um, there is a briefing Peter, do you want to pick Chair, up on that? yes we we'd intended to have uh, tourism and i and the department up on the 15th of july um, around a, an update briefing. That, we, we've had some problems with dates, so that's, that's not a date anymore. What we're going to do, um, in addition to arranging a future date, is bring in uh, Northern Ireland Tourism Alliance on the 8th of July um, to give, a, if you like, an immediate impact assessment mm -hmm. on what reopening uh, on the, at the end of June and at the start of July has been across the tourism and hospitality sector. So, it'll, if you like, it'll be... Uh, a really short order update on that. Um, we get a, a written briefing from TNI and the department in the meantime, but we seek uh, to look for an alternative date later on. Um, members had also um, discussed the potential of trying to look at maybe meeting outside the building on the 8th of July, so members are content we progress that um, and see just exactly how that can be done safely, but would be... Um, the idea being to see how um, tourism industry, hospitality industry is physically dealing with reopening. Um, there, there's nothing so useful as actually seeing how that operates. And I think for members, it'll be useful to be able to um, actually see what that's like and, and be able to answer questions and ultimately if, if they receive them from other people in the sector. Gordon can pass all the drink. <laughs> well, sure. Bring your wallet with you that there. You can pass all the drink. And buy you a Coke. <laughs> a little orange. Okay, so then moving on, there is 
correspondence even at page 198 from the Permanent Secretary regarding the non-domestic RHI scheme due to an error originating at the scheme administrator of GEM. Incorrect tariffs have been applied to a number of RHI technologies since April 2019, which means for a period from the 1st of April 2019 until 18th of May 2020, 325 installations have received an overpayment with a total financial impact of £25,000. The Permanent Secretary in his letter has outlined that as a result there will be a further strengthening of controls and if members have read the, the briefings they will see it's down to the rounding up of a twentieth of a penny. So um, <laughs> it's had a, a quite significant impact. Um, but, but sure, if there's one sector that should get their act together, it's this sector. Seriously, if they're, if they're coming back and saying they made another mistake or a, a mistake, it's... Well, this mistake was with off gem as I understand. Again. Yeah. Chair, the, the basic thing of finding issues is taking corrective action to ensure re recurrence does not happen. I find this most disappointing, and I think, it again, it highlights the need for further scrutiny. And I think we look forward to even the, the strengthening of the power that we were promised in relation to scrutiny and the importance of it and the importance of. Um, openness and accountability, and I think we're all for it. And uh, you know, I find it most disappointing, to be honest. Uh, and sir, I know it's being forwarded to the audit office, and no doubt the audit office will, will look into it. But there's no indication that anybody's been held to account, or it's just the, 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 there has been a desktop exercise in terms of correcting it. But I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, I read anywhere in it where somebody has been held to account or what account managers in terms of personnel running has been carried out around this. Um, as I said at the start, if there's any sector or any agency or which should be marking its homework over and over again, it's this one. And in um, the letter from the Permanent Secretary, he states it's his expectation that Ofgen will publicly take full responsibility for their um, so can we pick up on that and John and Gordon's points as well? Chair, we, we'll continue to monitor this when obviously members um, are aware that the consultation had been going on as well. Yeah. So there's a lot more to this um, in terms of uh, going forward. The committee will be um, looking at how the consultation goes, uh, talking again to the sector, because um, we've been continuing to get correspondence from the sector um, highlighting issues and their general disappointment and unhappiness with how the whole thing has been handled. So it's it's definitely um, will be back on the agenda many times. Okay. okay, moving on then to 6.3. There's correspondence from the House of Commons Treasury Committee at page 207 regarding our request for information on the business or uh, Brexit business grant funding. Um, and they have referred us to um, HMRC, but we have already... yeah, They've given us a, a clever, new, faster way in email address that we weren't aware of, so we will now use that instead in future correspondence. Okay, thank you. Um, 6.4, there's a copy of a response at page 208 from the Minister for Small Business, Consumers and Labour Markets to the House of Lords EU Internal Market Subcommittee's inquiry into UK-EU negotiations on level playing field and state aid. Um, so it's for noting unless members have anything in specific they want to pick up on. Okay. Um, 6.5, there's correspondence at page 216 from the Chair of the New House of Lords International Agreement Subcommittee regarding its inquiry into the UK-US trade negotiations. Um, so our members content to uh, forward the call for ev evidence on the inquiry to all other statutory committees. Yeah, yeah. but I think that, sorry through the Chair, I think that that highlights um, some issues maybe around uh, standards as well, uh, particularly food standards, so we should keep a watching um, eye on that. Uh, we will also be highlighting it to our, our stakeholders as well. Yeah, we... I think just picking up on what the Deputy Chair said, I know the agri-food sector yeah. will have a lot to input on this, so pushing um, the, the inquiry out to as many stakeholders as possible and if members then once we've got that out on social media, if you if you push it out further, that would be really helpful. Yep. Okay, 6.6 .6 then. There's correspondence from the EU Affairs Manager at page 226, providing a copy of a response from Treasuries um, on the Ireland NI protocol and VAT provisions. So again, it's for noting unless there's anything anyone wants to highlight. 
Okay. 6.7, there's correspondence from NUSUSI at page 235 calling for measures from the, from the executive to support young people to stay on in education during current economic difficulties. Um, the committee obviously discussed the need for a focus on apprenticeships at Monday's meeting and this has been included in the committee's response to June monitoring round which has been forwarded to the finance committee and um, will be reflected in um, the speaking note when the June monitoring round debate is held. Um, and obviously the, the issues are ones that we have been um, highlighting to the department. So if members are content, we will uh, forward it on to the department. Chair, it might just be worth flagging up. That was also an issue that was highlighted um, in the big letter that went to uh, a number of ministers, um, also Solis and Nilga. Um, there's also correspondence from NES, USI um, outlining support which students in Scotland are, are getting um, in terms of hardships. Uh, so we will also pass that on to the department. Um, okay, so 6.9 then, there's correspondence from the minister at page 34 of your table papers. And just give me a sec till I open up my table papers as well. Yep. Um, so there is clarification in relation to the guarantees of origin of electricity produced from high efficiency co-generation amendment EU exit regulations 2018. So that one's for noting unless there's anything. I, I can't give any more thrilling detail on that. I apologise. <laughs> um, at page 35 of your table papers then there is the consultation and parental bereavement leave and pay. Um, Peter, we, we are a super consultator, that is that Yes, correct? Chair. Um, members are aware that they had uh, agreed to act as a super consultator, as is the, the, the usual protocol with committee. So once the consultation is closed, um, the department will do an analysis, bring it to committee, and the committee can give its view based on what exactly has been said across the sector and members' own um, particular viewpoints. Okay. Um, then 6.11, there's a response from the Department of page 56 of your table papers in relation to queries from Presbyterian Mutual Society member. Um, are members content to note that? 6.12, then there's a response from the Department at page 60 of table papers uh, explaining the mutual recognition of professional qualifications is not dealt with in the protocol and that future arrangements in this will form part of the subject of negotiations. Um, between the UK and EU on future relationship. Uh, members had raised this issue when the committee looked at correspondence from the Minister re continuing mutual recognition with the EU during the transition period. So that one's for noting as well. Okay, so moving on then to um, item number seven, which is um, an SR. And sorry, just give me another second to go back. Um, so there is a clerk's memo at page 240, there is the SR and explanatory memorandum at page 242 and it's SR 2020-98, the student fee amounts amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, the statutory rule is subject to negative resolution when coming into operation on the 1st of September 2020. The committee has already considered the SL1 regarding the proposed or, or regulation sorry, at its meeting on the 27th of May and members were content with the policy proposals. Um, there have been no changes to policy content since then. Um, the examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this rule, so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Are members content with the SR? Agreed. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> uh, I yes, you need to read So the right. committee for the economy has considered SR 2020-98, the student fee amounts amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed. Um, okay, then item number eight, correspondence. Uh, there is correspondence from the Committee for Infrastructure at page 240, providing a copy of correspondence to the Economy Minister seeking an update on the funding package for ferry operators. Are members content to note? Agreed. Um, correspondence from the Committee of, for Finance at page 251, providing a copy of a response from the Finance Minister regarding financial assistance for road haulage um the taxi industry and the transport sector so um, that one is for the committee to note as well um, we are also highlighting these issues um, so, and we'll continue to do so um, the finance committee has asked for views um, about who would be responsible for bringing forward 
um, financial support to the road haulage sector. The Infrastructure Committee has already written to the Economy Minister asking her to work uh, with the Finance and Infrastructure Ministers. And they have, um, so if members are agreed, we will respond to the Finance Committee indicating the Infrastructure Committee has written to the Economy Minister <laughs> <laughs> on that matter. And we are content to wait for that response. It's complete. The policy is infrastructure chair. The mm -hmm. process will be finance. So it's kind of, we, we've ended up in the middle and people are writing via us and cross us. And so it's just become complicated. Is there any commitment, Chair, from any department towards funding it? Or is it back to the executive? Chair? That'll be an executive decision right, to, to, to make a funding it. package. But it has been discussed. Um, and the, the finance minister indicates there um, that he's um, indicated there, there will be, there, there's money that's been set aside already that hasn't been allocated, mm -hmm. so there's the potential to allocate money, but it, that'll be an executive decision because it's an executive pot, if you like. So there's, there's theoretically there's light, hope there. there is light theoretically the light, yes, theoretically. Would yes. you say that, Chair? There's light at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> <laughs> but there was 59.9 million it's a lot allocated, of money. so it's a lot, a lot of money. So if it could be, mm. no, and it is one that we are highlighting, and we've had contact around as well, um, and we will be continuing to, to press all of the, the yeah. ministers and departments about um, providing a support package. Chair, it also um, feeds into the. Um, EU exit negotiations as well. In terms of the protocol, there, there are a number of unknowns for, for Holliers because a lot of them um, have, they, they, they work cross border, they, they, you know, they, they might have premises in Donegal, but most mm. of their business is here or, or whatever. So th there's a lot to pin down for them, and in addition, the, the impact that COVID has had. So mm -hmm. it's an industry that, that does need a bit of attention. Okay, then at 8.3, there is a copy of correspondence from Gemma Allister, MLA, to the Minister for Economy, at page 255, regarding the concerns of constituent around the RHI scheme. So are members content to forward that to the department for a response? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, at page then, sorry, 8.4, there is a brochure from Yellow Design at page 258 in relation to its smart city tourism platform. Yeah. Um, Peter, you want to... Chair, yeah, this, if members have had a chance to look at it, it's very clever. And anyone who's had a, anything to do with augmented reality realises how, how useful it can be for multiple sectors, but particularly the, the tourism sector. So what they, they additionally were asking for is just the committee's um, endorsement for... They're, they're, they're making a 5G create bill. There's a fund. Um, so without specifically knowing exactly the details of what they're doing, it's, it's not really appropriate for the committee to endorse it per se. Um, but if the committee is willing, um, certainly if they've been impressed by what they've seen, then that can be conveyed, that the committee has um, seized the potential for augmented reality and would seek um, that the bid would be taken seriously, effectively falling short of endorsing, but, but certainly uh, making it... Um, making it aware that the committee's looked at it. Yeah. Chair, Ms. Sefton. Um, just on that point, who, who was the business again? It's Yellow Design. Okay. Um, um, they have, um, they have government um, funding already for some of the project work that they've undertaken. That's, that's been supported work. And now they're bidding for bigger work, if you like, into bigger funds. Um, so it's, it's looking for support for okay, that. Um, no, I suppose the reason I ask is, um, and I will declare an interest in this, um, I, I'm conscious that the FE colleges um, are teaching uh, uh, subjects in relation to augmented reality, yeah. and my interest is because my husband does it. Um, I just, you know, I think it would be prudent of this committee to even, you know, see if there were opportunities to connect that into the students' learning and their experience and in industry, because that's essentially what FE you know, colleges exist for. So. Um, you know, I, 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 it was great to see this type of work going forward, but I, you know, I think we should cross it over where we can, if they're interested. Chair, I know, I know there's a fair bit of work going on with this. I know across a number of departments, um, and it, it feeds right back. The colleges have been doing this kind of work for quite some time because it, it is uh, definitely the future. Like members will have seen various versions of this, and then moving on into virtual reality as well. 
Um, so absolutely. Um, it might even be worth, um, at a future date, um, when you know everything permits, actually going to see this being done, because it's incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah Chair, no, no, just to absolutely support that, I think that uh, it's all very, th this technology was coming forward, but given the social distancing and given COVID-19, it's even more uh, important because when you go to a tourist facility and you're able to access everything on your, your mobile or your tablet, but also um, with the, the you know, 3D figures behind you or whatever, you're actually promoting <laughs> the tourism facility as well. So I think it's something that we really should be supporting. I appreciate we can't maybe fully endorse, but I think that we should say that we're supportive of this type of technology. Sure, just on that point, interestingly, they, they actually have the, the two metre distancing built yeah. into the, it is, yeah. the oh, way it works. So it, it, is, it's very, it is very clever because it shows you your circle. Yeah, it might be because uh, I've seen that mm -hmm. there. I think they forwarded a, yeah, a YouTube yeah. link as well. So mm -hmm. um, maybe circulate that to members, and it maybe is something that we or should look at uh, getting um, so them to maybe yeah, show us that something maybe that, really um, that tourism briefing that we're trying to organise, mm -hmm. like we could incorporate in. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, moving on then to um, 8.5. There was correspondence from a member of the public at page 274 concerning the price of liquefied petroleum gas in the north compared to England. Um, our members consent to write to the department to ask for views on this issue. Yeah, what about referring it to the utility regulator as well? Um, that too is chair as a possibility. Uh, it, it might be a case of getting um, the, the committee, the uh, department's view first and then referring that on, if, if members are content, just so that we have something concrete. I think it has been round a few houses, that one, yeah. to be honest. But it seems extortionate um, yeah. through the chair. Like, I, I don't understand why it's 77% higher here than it would be in England. John, you were... There, there's a question in my head as to whether liquid petroleum gas falls under the regulator. Well, it, it's just... Testing yeah. my... No, I'm, I'm, I'm not... I think you're, I think you're potentially right, actually, because it's... Well, it's um, this is an argument. The, the legislation, the legislation is very firmly with economy in terms of you've seen before um, transportation of gas is under pressure. We've, we've yes, passed right, regulations and so on on that. But I think Mr. O'Dowd may well be right in the gas. Is I need to check. It's uh, it's the it's the nature of what it is. I just need to check that because I I was thinking in terms of gas, but I suppose mains gas is regulated. Yeah, but I don't. Well know. I don't I honestly will need to check up on that. Check. I met with Jenny Powell before and raised it when we were talking about gas previously, just for yeah. houses and the, the fluctuations yes. of gas prices, and it wasn't something that was on her desk as one of her remits. Okay. While she was able to inf potentially have a say in it, it wasn't right. something that she was able to control. Chair, a lot of what the additional cost seems to be is around supply, transportation and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what can be done to improve that. Mm -hmm. and. I suppose also going forward, um, it's going to be the place that liquid petroleum gas falls into in a new energy strategy, a new renewables mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. focus, more green focused strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's worth getting a departmental view on because at least that way we'll know if that exists, mm -hmm. if there's a strategy going forward, if they um, are taking this under their notice, if they have plans to do something about it. Um, and I'll, I'll do some further homework on who regulates. Mm -hmm. Thank you. While we're on that subject, Chair, if you don't mind me coming in, just on the regulator, um, something I've been pushing for a long time, it might be, it depends on where you are in the country, areas where gas currently exists, there is a gap of what's called infilling. Mm. So for those properties that are in touch and distance to the pipeline, but can't get it, it affects about 6,000 properties in the Greater Belfast area and in other areas where the gas line has been ruled out. The regulator had assured me that it would be going to their board to be signed off so that the um, installers like Phoenix could then go and do it free of charge. Otherwise, it costs an astronomical amount of money for an individual to get access to that. As we are, as part of a strategy, trying to promote more gas use, etc., could we be ready as a committee to see what is happening with that strategy and whether or not infilling is going to be allowed? Or just to get an update because mm -hmm. um, I have had three or four meetings and several letters and feels that we're getting progress, but we don't actually see it. Would you would the would the committee be agreeing to that or could agree? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on then, six point or eight point six even. 
There is correspondence from a local business owner at page 278 in relation to the grant scheme and lack of support from multiple uh, store groups. So obviously this is an issue that we have raised on a number of occasions, so are the committee content to forward this correspondence on as well? Yeah, great. Yeah. So this links to the correspondence we just received this morning from the Minister as well in terms of the reprofiling or potential reprofiling of the hardship fund uh, and a number of questions that were put to her today. It's not clear from the latter, uh, and maybe you can be, someone can remind us, uh, in terms of the June monitoring process as to whether the Minister, there was money surrendered as to whether the Minister made a bid for that money to be returned to her department to to be used in schemes like this? Was. Chair, just, just to flag up to words, I emailed you on a letter during yeah. the meeting, plus a couple of press releases, um, effectively dealing with the hardship fund that the, the Minister had indicated earlier, um, that she would be seeking a, an executive decision on this. But as, as Mr O'Dowd said, the letter indicates that there has, it doesn't look like there's been any actual bid around it. It's the, the there's a figure now for the number of applicants to the hardships fund. Um, it's it's over four thousand three hundred now, but still a lot less than expected. That will now have to be played out in terms of looking at what the surplus is, and then once the surpluses of the three funds have been identified, the executive will look at that. But but absolutely, there there doesn't appear to have been a specific bid, as it were, on any surplus money will go into the hardship fund. It will be expanded. Um, and as, as members um, are aware, the, the Minister didn't offer any further clarification on that this morning. So, uh, it's, it, it, I, I now can't recall whether the Minister said we discussed tomorrow or Monday. I think she said she'll do it in a paper or next Monday? week. Yeah. Yes, Monday. Um, and it may be a case then of once that has gone to the Executive, the Committee then well, the committee can write now and ask for uh, feedback on that. Okay. Um, could we write to the Northern Ireland Executive as a whole? You know, because it seems to be at this stage, and specifically to COVID-related responses, it's Northern Ireland Executive that's taking uh, the decisions rather than the minister herself. Um, and, and maybe even ask the question, you know, is the minister, maybe this is to her, um, does she intend to submit a paper to extend the hardship fund? She has said that she... Yeah. <laughs> I feel like she suggested it, but to kind of follow on from John's point, I'm not sure it's definite. <laughs> the letter, Chair, the letter does appear to say, um, because the committee had asked for an extension on the closing date and uh, a fast decision on reallocation of funds, what the letter is saying is that the scheme is closed, um, the calculation of surplus will be made, uh, as with other funds where there's a surplus and that will go to the executive for decision. I suppose where the, the issue is slightly different from others is that that money can't be done as an internal reallocation because it was voted on by the executive. Mm -hmm. Those are executive supported funds. Therefore, as the Minister I think points out in the letter, it's got to be an executive decision as to what to do with them. It doesn't stop the Minister in her paper saying it would be ideal to do this because obviously she'll have the evidence to set out a case as to who hasn't got what surpluses there are and so on. But there isn't any more um, detail beyond that. Certainly the, the committee has, on, on a number of occasions now, made its feeling on the need to widen out the criteria of the hardship fund. Also in terms of that, the committee has supplied um, survey data that, that we put together ourselves on who hasn't got and the quantum of that um, and variations of, of, of sectors and so on, basically everything we could possibly pin down. So all that evidence base is there. Um, it's also gone to the finance minister as well. So we, the committee has made it very clear what it wants and how or who has not been um, supported so far. Um, so it's where members want to go from there. I suppose. Yeah, t Chair, sorry, just to come in. No, no, I, I think that clears up the point that I was going to make because I think for many of us, well, certainly, I can only speak for myself, there was an expectation when the June monitoring round was mm -hmm. been yeah, discussed that there would be 
some nod, certainly to uh, the, the hardship and, and, and the, the monies that um, weren't spent. But at the same time, I appreciate that actually sits outside of the June Monitoring Round. Is that fair to say in terms of the, the, the allocations? It, it, it's it's basically something the minister couldn't reallocate herself. herself. It's not it's not technically her yeah. her fund. It's it's an executive no, no, I th fund. I think that that's the point. So what we'll, we'll, we need to get to. I think the minister understands the position of the committee. If she doesn't, then I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and I think you know, so. And I think she's very sympathetic to that. So. I, I'm, I'm certainly not against that. I think Claire's idea and John's idea is quite sensible. I think it probably does no harm uh, once again to re reiterate that point mm. uh, to the executive. And if there is a paper, then um, which we don't know what's going to be in the paper, but I'm assuming it's going to be you know, requesting additional support for the, the, the expansion of the hardship scheme. Yeah, I accept that uh, the minister had to return the money to the centre uh, because it was an executive fund or bid. Uh, but if there's no bid from the Department of the Economy to the Finance Minister or to the executive, then that won't be returned. So mm. there needs to be a bid. And the paper the minister referred to, there needs to be a recommendation on it uh, to provide support to the people we've talked about, the sole traders and others. Now, I, I'm in generous mood this morning, so perhaps the minister didn't want to, uh, didn't want to outline to the committee ahead of executive discussions what exactly was in the paper. So we can... But we've made, as it's been said, we've made our views clear uh, what, what we want to say. Yeah, there is a protocol there um, that it, it, the minister wouldn't preempt a paper that has mm. yet okay. been seen by the executive, so that's an established protocol. Okay. Um, okay, moving on then to 8.7. There is. Um, sure, I'm just. Can I just. So, does the committee. Would the committee still like a alert of FM and DFM reiterating um, yeah. that. You know, they're obviously going to get the paper on Monday, or for yeah Monday next week, and it'll be considered at the executive table, and, and that will be led by FM and DFM. So, uh, and it might be useful to write to the economy minister as well and ask that she would include a recommendation around the committee's yeah. concerns. Yeah. Okay, we we'll do that. Moving on, Chair. Sure, sorry, Chair. Sure. I was slightly concerned around the gin monitoring in relation to the cash flow issue that we discussed on Monday's meeting, and I'm worried. You know, when can we expect royal assent so that that budget can go through and it can cover those, uh, I suppose, losses? Because I'm just concerned that the finance minister says, right, I'm going to give you another 36, um, and you know, <laughs> what about everything else that you know that she's needed? I just worry that that's coming quicker than maybe. Chair, members will recall the, the additional vote, the, the unexpected vote on account was because there were five departments that would have run out of money before the number two budget bill received royal assent. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a supply vote to allow them to, to you know, have a continuation of funds um, and profile going forward. It has been highlighted to us that there's been a delay on, on royal assent. I don't particularly understand why that is. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't want to say it's unusual. But I, I just don't understand why it is. Um, it might be worth me actually just having a word um, with the finance clerk as to whether that committee's already been informed as to why that's happening. We don't have a date uh, either for the um, debate on the discussion in the chamber on the June monitoring round outcome. That's that's not. There's no speculative date on that yet. Um, but you would assume it needs to be fairly soon. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not entirely sure, Chair, where that leaves us in terms of a time scale. I suppose, I'm just I suppose coming out of the executive meeting on Monday, if they make a decision, then the finance minister can, can make a statement. Sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm, Chair, I'm sorry. I suppose I'm interested in that because they, they've described it as a cash flow issue. So, if when it receives royal assent, is that a surplus 36? Because then the royal assent will have gone through and then it will have recalibrated. And then, because that's coming from it, that's additional money is coming from the Northern Ireland. Consoli consolidated fund? <laughs> um, um, and I just wondered, is that then surplus and is there an opportunity for uh, Maybe I'm completely misunderstanding it. Chair, my fair. understanding would be that no, it's not, because the FTC drawdown is dependent on a number of criteria okay. um, being met and signed up to. And because of, the, the, because of COVID, the, the, the rules on that haven't been able to be applied. Mm -hmm. So the, the money in the meantime is money that's needed for immediate cash flow and that theoretically, and I'm making a theoretical judgment here, going forward that money then would not need to be drawn down as part of the FTC but that may not be the okay. case because delays, as members will know, 
raise costs. Yeah. But the, the cash flow situation is being filled by this vote from the consolidated yeah. fund because FTC can't be completed and started to be drawn. And then when down. that's rectified, that 36 will fill elsewhere. Is that right? <laughs> Theoretically. Theoretically. Through the chair, so it's not just like 25 up front, take 25 away from the FTC. That's entirely dependent on the situation that will exist when the FTC can be drawn down. As I say, delay in any kind of project raises costs. Yeah. I'm wary of getting into because I would purely be speculating there, but the immediate issue is the, is the, the 25 uh, plus has been drawn down from the consolidated fund to um, fill an immediate cash flow issue. And was there a business case to I'm assuming along, that right? would all have to go through, yeah, because you, you, that kind of money just doesn't happen. And, and, a, and a, an allocation from the consolidated fund won't happen without a number of criteria being met. Um, there are systems for everything and protocols for everything. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> we can talk further. Doesn't make that. sense, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Move on then to eight point seven. Um, at page two hundred seventy nine of your pack, there is a European Commission circular economy action plan. So, unless members have anything to suggest, um, it's for noting for now. Great. Um, at page sixty three of your table papers, there's correspondence from the Communities Committee um, regarding social distancing issues for those with visual impairment. And so, is the committee content to forward that to the department for consideration as requested? Yes. Okay. Um, forward work program then is at page 66 of your table papers. Um, and I think we've discussed this already. So, if members are agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Any other business? Um, for, um, the one question I didn't get put to the minister just have we got a copy of the terms of reference of the economy advisory group? Not yet, no. Can we request a copy? Absolutely, yes. Um, we still have a little final in terms of reference for the tourism one either. We've had a draft set, but not a final set. So we absolutely, yeah, we can request that. Just, just very briefly, um, the city deal stuff, there was a very extensive uh, briefing provided. I just didn't feel that maybe there was enough time to maybe get into the detail of that, just given the fact that the minister was here. Um, and would it be possible, to be, um, even if it's an informal meeting, uh, over the next uh, week or two, um, to try and schedule that in? I just think it's important, given the, the fact that you're using 800 million worth of capital projects, and, and to be perfectly honest, I might know a bit about you know, my own local area, but I certainly don't know an awful lot about what's happening in other areas. And I just, you can see the, the narrative now around duplication and, and projects. So, I think as a committee, we need to be um, all across that. Would that be a possibility? Chair, we, we had um, originally um, programmed it in as a standalone briefing. Then other pressures came to play in terms of being able to get the Minister back to comment on, on other issues. Um, so it's, it's on our, our list. But I think, Chair, as, as Mr Middleton has suggested, an informal discussion might be an easier way to deal with it in terms of being able to pick the particular pieces you're most interested in and have a, a, a chat in, in, a, in a more expansive way on that. Okay, then um, also there is normal practice for committees to delegate authority to the chair and deputy chair during recess to submit views on releasing or withholding information in any non-routine or contentious <laughs> FOI request. Um, in the previous mandate, at least one of the last meetings of each session, the committee agreed to this delegation of authority and that the committee would be advised of any such request, the views expressed by the chair and deputy chair um, and the response <coughs> issued by the FOI unit at the first available meeting. So are members content with that practice? It's risky, but we'll, we'll live with it. <laughs> <laughs> So our next meeting is tomorrow. It's an informal meeting um, on starting on the uh, on Brexit. Oh, nice um, and mm -hmm. permanent secretary will also be at the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, the clerk has already circulated the link for the meeting. Um, and we'll I'll be issuing another memo the, later today on that. It's Eleven o'clock, is it? Eleven o'clock on Starleaf. Okay, and then our next formal meeting is Monday at ten a.m. here in room thirty. If you want to press the button. Good job. Members, just before you leave...
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.